This is the Occult Beatles. Hello, I'm Matt Sergio, proprietor of the website The Occult Beatles, a website that takes a look at the conspiratorial and occult aspects of the Beatles, whether alleged or not. As I'm recording this now, it's November 12th, 2023, and at the end of this month, so I'm informed, uh, a new book contradicting the official accounts of John Lennon's shooting will be released. TV producer David Whelan is the author and the researcher of the book. He began to research it and write it during the lockdown of 2020. Uh, I spoke with him earlier this month in November. I've recorded a chat with him and uh, if you stick around you can hear that. Uh, During our chat I asked him to elaborate and clarify on some of the inconsistencies and anomalies that are present in the official narrative of Lennon's shooting on that night in December 1980 and that I myself have come across over the years in my own research and as have fellow researchers Mark Devlin and Desiree Hall, my co-hosts on the Beatles related podcast series Magical Mystery Talk. Uh, Back in 2020, myself, Desiree and Mark recorded a two-episode special edition of the podcast series to acknowledge the 40 years since the shooting occurred outside John's apartment building, the Dakota, in New York. And a lot of the research that we as co-hosts had uncovered over the years with regards to Lennon's shooting was highlighted in that two-part special edition. Uh, If you haven't heard those two episodes and you're listening to this now on my YouTube page, uh, Conspiro TV, or at my Spreaker page, then look down below here uh, and you'll find them attached as links. Uh, If you do listen to those, you'll hear me talk about a guy by the name of Milton Klein, who, after Lennon's shooting, was asked by a judge to psychologically assess Mark David Chapman, the man currently in jail for gunning Lennon down. Uh, From my own research, I've found that Klein may well have been involved at some point in his life with a CIA behavioural modification project called Operation Bluebird that was designed to administer hypnotism and drugs for and I quote, according to official documents, and I quote, personality control purposes. So, to come in this chat with David Whelan on the alternative version of John Lennon's shooting, David talks about Milton Klein and also some other rather suspect individuals, including Bernard Diamond, a psychiatrist who was also an expert witness in the trial of Sirhan Sirhan, the man jailed for the shooting of Robert Kennedy. Diamond also assessed Chapman with Klein in Chapman's cell, but Whelan says it was Klein who was at the helm. He headed up a very large and nefarious hypnosis uh, kind of to describe it, organisation, uh, where you had people like Richard Bloom, another uh, military slash hypnosis guy who, who was an associate of Klein, who also piled into Mark Chapman's police cell with, uh, with Bernard Diamond, who also worked on Siren Siran. So you had all these nefarious hypnotists, Milton Klein, Bernard Diamond, Bloom, Richard Bloom, you know, just piling in there, shutting the door and having Mark Chapman all to themselves. Also, David takes the view that, amongst others, the covering up of the true facts surrounding Lennon's killing were helped along by a historically corrupt New York police department. I think there was a group that controlled the investigation and the NYPD, which was, if you look up NYPD corruption, 1970s, 1980s, probably one of the most corrupt police forces in history. Um, So I don't think that would have been very difficult to get an investigation quashed or over overlooked in many areas. And I think there was a media organization uh, that made sure that disinformation was seeped out over many years in many documentaries and books and articles to keep people confused. Yeah, disinformation. There's a lot of that that surrounds Mark David Chapman. And so Whelan says... Mark Chapman, who I believe was a Manchurian Patsy, by the way. I don't think he was a Manchurian assassin. I think he was there just to be sitting there confused, standing there confused, not quite sure what he'd done. Also, during my chat with David, we talk about the notorious Jose Padermo, the doorman at the Dakota apartment building on the night of the shooting, and who for years has been suspected, or indeed believed, uh, outside the confines of the mainstream arena and media as the actual man who fired the shots that brought down Lennon. There's a consensus uh, amongst a lot of people that have looked into the alternative version of events surrounding Lennon's shooting that he was actually the one and the same Jose Padermo who, back in the early 1960s, was part of Operation 
Mission 40, a CIA hit squad formed around the time of the Bay of Pigs mission, a mission that attempted to overthrow Cuba's President Castro. It said that Mark Chapman, whilst hanging around outside the Dakota apartment building in the lead up to Lennon's shooting, talked about the Bay of Pigs with Dorman Perdomo. But, Whelan says, he's not convinced that Dorman Perdomo was CIA Bay of Pigs Perdomo, or that he shot the former Beatle. No, I don't think he shot John Lennon. I mean, he might, he was there. He's just not Bay of Pigs Perdomo. I, I, I can verify it. I can understand why people got excited about it, and I think it was a red herring that was deliberately put out there. David and I also talk about some of the witness accounts of those who were at the scene or near to it when the shooting took place, and some of which are questionable, including the accounts of Richard Peterson, the cab driver who pulled up outside the Dakota behind the limo that John and his wife Yoko Ono got out of just moments before John was shot. We mentioned Paul Goresh, a rather suspect guy who used to hang around outside the Dakota building back in 1980 and who was the last man to photograph Lennon. We also talk about the doctor and nurses who tended to Lennon after his shooting and the contradictory accounts of where the bullets actually hit him. Uh, According to the official accounts, Lennon was shot four times in the back by Chapman, but this contradicts what the nurses and one of the doctors said when the former Beatle was brought into the hospital. And this would suggest that actually the fatal shots were fired from another location, so not by Chapman. There's also passing mention of the novel Catcher in the Rye that's said to have served as Chapman's mind control trigger book. All this to come and much, much more. So then, according to the official narrative, John Lennon was shot in the back four times by Chapman, as I say, after John and Yoko got out of their limousine that had parked up on the street outside of the giant archway entrance of the Dakota. Uh, John and Yoko had just returned from the record plant recording studio. So to give you a mental image of the scene around Lennon on that night when he was shot, how it looked, And uh, this is important to take note of if we're to understand the official narrative and how it doesn't match up with what it would seem actually really happened. Uh, And if you'd like some extra help, what I've done, if you're listening to this on my YouTube channel, Conspiro TV, or via my Spreaker page, what I've done is I've added some links underneath, some photographs of the Dakota entrance how it looks, okay, to give you that mental image, to help you along if you want to set the scene, as it were, inside your head. So to get a mental image then, the Dakota has a giant archway entrance with a narrow driveway in the middle of it, leading into and under that archway. Under this archway entrance, with that driveway in the middle, Um, Okay, this led up to an actual entrance, a doorway entrance, which took you into the inside of the building. Now, if you're standing outside on the street, looking towards the Dakota and under that archway entrance, that doorway entrance into the actual inside of the building is on the right. Okay, to paraphrase Whelan, this doorway had six steps leading up from it, and those steps lead up to a set of oak doors and then into the concierge's desk and office space on the left. Beyond the concierge's desk are stairs and elevators that lead up to the apartments of that wing of the Dakota. On the night of the killing, okay, the open doorway leading into the inside of the Dakota from that driveway entrance, that doorway entrance into the actual building itself, had a pair of glass vestibule doors attached to it. On the street outside, where that archway entrance is, if you look on the outside, on the left is a small booth. That's the doorman's booth. On duty that night was doorman Jose Padermo. Also on duty was Dakota service lift operator Joseph Manny and also Jay Hastings, the concierge. So, I'll give you a bit of background on David Whelan, his CV. He grew up in North London, he's got an Irish background. And after leaving school in the 1980s, eventually got a job working for Thames Television, a regional broadcaster in Britain that specialised in providing local news and TV shows for London, but that also produced programmes for the rest of the country. He got the job at Thames thanks to a YTS scheme. Uh, Anyone who grew up in the UK in the 1980s will know what YTS is. It stood for Youth Training Scheme and was 
basically a government-backed training scheme for young school leavers, basically a, a government-funded apprenticeship scheme that allowed youngsters to get employment in many walks of life. Anyway, also worth noting perhaps is that Thames TV was a big deal at the time. Anyone who grew up and or was around in Britain in the 70s, 80s and 90s will be well aware of Thames TV because it produced some of the country's biggest and best known TV shows from sitcoms to dramas to you name it. So yeah, David went to Thames TV in the 1980s on a YTS and started there as a, an assistant film editor and then in the latter part of the 1980s he went on to work in the news department of Thames as a researcher before moving into sports in the 1990s which he says he much preferred. Um, as you'll hear David say now uh, mainstream media news reporting and research he says is often sadly lacking, lacking in depth, is biased, lazy, misrepresentative and unjust and uh, before he and I got on to talking about Lennon, we spoke for a bit of time about his years working in mainstream media. I wanted to get his take on what he got from looking at the workings of mainstream news reporting and gathering at one of the UK's largest local broadcasters, Thames TV. That gave me a little insight into how mainstream news works and uh, you know it's kind of at the time and you just take it all for granted but you understand how the editor talks to the sub-editor and then talks to the journalists and then you see what you know mainstream tv journalists are like at the sort of ground level when the cameras are off and, and they're all you know they're all desperate to read the news basically um and they're all desperate there's a lot of ego there which is something i observed very early mm -hmm. on yeah. Uh, not an awful lot of talent, um, but you, you sort of soon get to realise that the way every story is shaped comes down through the editor into, into the sub-editor, into the journalist here. And, and it's kind of done, it's, it's not explicit. It's a bit like today, really. They, they sort of knew with every single story, which often was repeated over many weeks, what the angle was. And if they dared sort of stray away from that angle, they'd get pulled into the sub-editor's uh, office and uh, you know told how to get back on track uh, and obviously the sub-editor was taking the editor's directive and the editor was taking you know the MD of Thames, Thames Television directive who no doubt was taking his directive from politicians and, and all the rest of it so it was interesting to see just at a research ground level how all this worked in a, in a buzzy newsroom and it was, it was a wonderful again great experience to be in a newsroom like that where news is breaking every moment every day and, and everybody takes it all very seriously you know it's it's amazing how they feel or they felt at the time, and I'm sure they still do, uh, news journalists, that they're, they're very much the kind of epicentre of the world and they're the mm. most important people on the planet. Uh, they just kind of, there's, there's a, I think ego is the key word there. There's a lot of ego there going on. And I think oh, that, that's yeah. probably still the case, actually. Yeah. So, and, and, and that kind of gets, a, it sort of bleeds a little bit into what we're talking about here, that I think with the internet exposing a lot of new information for people. And I think things like, you know, 9-11 and JFK and RFK and all the stuff that came into more prominence after the internet, sort of late 90s kind of introduction to the world. I, I think people that were mainstream journalists, researchers, academics, writers, I think they found it really hard and still do to get their head around the fact that they had this very expensive prestigious education and and probably quite comfortable job and even with all that they still don't really understand how things went down which is why this you've got this cognitive dissonance with regards to big events like JFK and they just won't go there and it, it's almost again it's a kind of ego thing and, and they just they just can't accept that they were duped basically um, uh, and I don't think and I don't think they ever will and just to put my cod um, psychiatrist hat on, I think there's also the element, especially with the killing of John Lennon, that you're questioning something that goes to the very core of their upbringing. If you've been brought up listening to the songs of the Beatles, for example, and then you give them uh, an alternative version to what might have happened surrounding his death or indeed the story of the Beatles, the Beatles rise to fame. We have this story that is given to us by the you know, the official narrative of the Beatles story, which has become myth-like, 
um, mm. and and somebody somebody might come along, a journalist, a commentator, whatever, a historian, and challenge parts of that. And for somebody who dismisses that, who hears that and dismisses it, it's big. I think there's the one of the reasons for that is because you're you're basically chipping away at their rose tinted view of how they grew up. You know, you're you're chipping away at their their romantic you know visions of of their past you know of when they were growing up you're 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 basically destroying their world and and i think there's there's a lot to say for the fact that you they they don't want that they they can't accept that so the best way to to dismiss that is just to ignore it and just to, to put the fingers in their ears and go la 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 you know um yeah i i agree i agree with you matt totally yeah i i think you know there's lots of different reasons why people can't get their head around. Um, and we're not going to use that phrase. Uh, you know, you know, the, the magic phrase, the CT phrase, uh, that I suppose we, we have to, we have to say <laughs> yeah. it because I, I, I just don't want to, you know, when, when you do it, when you do this kind of work and you spend three years investigating something and then for someone just to dismiss it as a conspiracy theory, it, it just makes you want to throttle them, to be honest with you. Um, because, I mean, we, we should get into that in a minute, you know, yeah. the conspiracy theories and, and just how it's been. They're all, if, if you believe one, oh, you must be into flat earth. You must believe, you know, that, you know, Donald Trump is an alien. It, it just, it just gets silly. And, and it's, they're, they're not all equal. Just like all religions aren't equal, all conspiracy theories aren't equal. You know, nothing is equal. It's, it's, you know, life is more nuanced than that. And, um, it does annoy me. And it's, it's just such an easy, uh SWAT, isn't it? Are oh, you just a conspiracy theorist? Ignore, move on. Um and, yeah. and, you know, the, the the Lenin stuff, you know, I I've had a very interesting six months since April since I broke this story. It's been uh yeah, I mean I I knew what was coming for sure, because I I've kind of dipped my toe into the JFK waters for a few years. So I know how that community operates and I know how that community is accepted. Uh, in the world, and obviously, you look at the career of someone like Oliver Stone, who is a you know a fantastic writer, a fantastic director, a fantastic man. And you know, after JFK, his career slowly tanked and was yeah. slowly throttled. You know, he was slowly throttled to death creatively, and you know, the finance just couldn't couldn't be couldn't be sought anymore. And you know, his recent JFK documentary piece he had to you know independently finance it he couldn't find anybody couldn't find a studio willing to have the guts to to kind of go there and that's that's with the, the jfk case that we all know today is it's, it's just I, I would say over 90 percent of the world now know that lee harvey oswald didn't do that so even with something that well known and that well kind of established you're still struggling against that cognitive dissonance um and you've got to remember that, that those kind of journalists, and, there's, and it's probably you know true today, they're, they're not investigative journalists. They're, they're not they're not trained to go looking for other angles. They're not tra- they don't have the time to to go deep. So when, when they cover a story, it really is just just covering it pretty straight, um, and and they're not looking for another angle at all. The angle is established very early on. This person did it. This this housing uh, scheme is bad. This housing scheme is good. And once the angle is established, they stick to it and they don't sort of go, actually, you know, for the last three months, we said that that this guy did this thing and it was horrible and heinous. Actually, there's some evidence now that he might not have done it. They're just not going to go there. It's just there would be too. Uh, there's not time is an issue, but also, you know, they kind of it was a bit like fast food news in a way, local news, it's, it's just very quick, very transient, get it in, get it out, and then move up to something else. So, and I think our national news today is, is very much like that, you know, the 24-hour stuff. Obviously, there's commentary now that's in there, which we never had before. So they have to roll out 24-hour news with a lot of commentary. And, and that's that's obviously dreadful, and it's often unbalanced. So I, I think Thames News, the, the only... Um, so if you know, in my day, if I wanted to research something, I had to go to the library and try and find a book. Um, mm. Very hard. You know, you forget how difficult it was to do research back. Then. Um, so most people didn't bother, to be honest. Um, so the internet really did open everything up uh, for good, mostly good, also partly bad. Um, we can talk about a lot of the Lenin myths that I think have been 
you know, you know, not not through any uh, through any bad intention, but there's been a lot of myths that have kind of grown up just through what I think is just bad research. What were you Someone with is, regards to the shooting? Yeah, just regards to the whole thing. I mean, we, we talk about the certain yeah. myths that I believe are, are there. I'm sure okay. in a moment, but I'll, I'll but, pencil yeah, that I, I in think, now. Yeah, yeah, the okay. internet is a great is, is mostly a great thing. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, but also it can it can it can it can help to foster and grow myths that that cloud the real truths. And okay, the Lennon yeah. murder has has plenty of those. Right. I'll pencil that in for a little bit later. I've got that down. Okay. <laughs> Lennon okay. myths. All right. Then. So, how does a gentleman like yourself go from, you know, super mainstream news background, working for mm-hmm. Thames Television, to uh, looking at the conspiracies behind? john lennon's killing writing a book about it researching uh, for a book you know uh, challenging the official narrative as it were how, how, how mm. did that happen uh good question <laughs> um successful career in sports television uh throughout the whole 90s and, and a lot of the two, early 2000s so very successful worked at very high end producing sports films and running sports production companies and and just you know, sport was I enjoyed it. It was well paid. I traveled a lot. But ultimately, you're not going to be intellectually satisfied producing sport. So, uh, you know, I, I got my kicks through reading books and doing research outside the sport. But, you know, producing sport, for anyone who's thinking of doing it, is as fun as it looks. But you're not going to you're not going to come away thinking I, I feel satisfied that, I, you know, I saw that amazing game or I produced that amazing event. Um, so it, it only gave me so much. Um, with regards to how I got into John Lennon, I, I kind of a big moment I should I should state was 1991's Oliver Stone JFK film for me. Um, I, I have Irish families, and if you go to a lot of Irish homes in the 70s and 80s, and possibly even now, I certainly remember it as a child. One of my earliest memories was, was seeing a picture of JFK on the wall. He's kind of considered Irish. I hate to say the word royalty, but you know he's he's obviously for a lot of my Irish family, he was considered a great man. And so I always remembered him being a presence in, in the homes that I visited when I was younger. And obviously, as you get older, you, you know, you get to understand what he tried to do. And there's a lot of myths about him. I mean, there was garbage JFK mafia stuff. I think there's going to be a JFK mafia film coming out soon with Al Pacino. It's just, I mean, that mafia stuff has been completely uh debunked now by jim diogenio on his amazing kennedys and king website so if anybody wants to know the truth about jfk please as far as i'm concerned go to kennedys and king and and do a bit deeper research but but getting back to jfk because of my interest in him as a child when that film came out in 1991 i went to see it thinking it was just going to be a biography i had no idea what the context of the film was and that that two and a half hours you know again to coin a cliche was a red pill moment for me and I came out thinking, wow, there's so much I don't know. Um, So I I quickly got the Jim Mars book, which that film was partly based on. And I just started to research the JFK assassination, you know, in earnest uh, in the 90s. And again, you had to wait for the next book. You know, there was no way you could go any deeper before the Internet. Uh, But there were quite a few books at that point. And then you start JFK, you instantly move into the RFK assassination. And then that's the first time I think I might have heard the phrase brainwashed. Um, and then you go from there. You can some people and I, I know I did. You start to dabble in, in Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King. And then you start to see a pattern. And then you understand and then the CIA just keeps coming up and you start looking into them and, and you know, what they got up to. And, and so I've always had this interest, but it's been very much on the back burner. I, w- I wouldn't call it a passion, just 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 a, just an interest, just like I'm interested in a lot of other subjects. Um, and the John Lennon one, up until 2020, up until lockdown 2020, uh, I kind of, you know, I thought the Chapman thing was a bit weird. I mean, I remember it as a 14-year-old child. It was a big event, of course. Uh, I remember seeing all the headlines on the newspapers when I was travelling to school. Um, but yeah, the Beatles meant nothing to me in 1980, to be honest. And John Lennon meant nothing to me in 1980. I was very much into other other music then. Um so I, I kind of, by the time I got to 2020, I, I, I was completely ignorant of, of the case, really. Uh, I, I kind of mostly believed what I was told. It seemed a bit weird that he seemed to have some obsession with a book. It seemed to be a bit weird that he got this book out, apparently, after he allegedly shot John. And, 
the catch. It's all a bit world. weird. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we're not allowed to talk about him. You know, he's so evil and he's so desperate for fame. We should never talk about him. So I kind of just, yeah, okay, that's that's that. I mean, there's, there's, I suppose there's only so many cases and 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 kind of theories and and interesting stories that you can keep in your brain. You know, you can kind of over, you can overload on this stuff. So that was probably one too many at that point. But to get to where I got to now, and to answer your question, how I managed to get into this. Uh, the, the good thing about lockdown for me, and I didn't agree with lockdown, I, I still don't agree with lockdown, um, but at the time when it first happened, I found it quite quite refreshing that the whole world just was put on pause for a few weeks, which is all I thought it was going to be and all I hoped it would be. Well, that's nice. I can just kind of, I don't feel guilty. I've got this kind of thing where if I'm not working really hard, I feel guilty. Uh, so I just thought, that's, that's nice. I can not work and not feel guilty. Fantastic. And just relax and take a few weeks off and not worry about doing work. So that, that was good. And I, I kind of embraced that initially. And while I was in that kind of state of mind where my mind was kind of in a relaxed, take it easy vein, I was out walking my dog in a field, listening to a podcast called Black Ops Radio. I don't know if you've ever heard that. No, I but, haven't. No. It's, yeah, it's good. It's kind of the definitive, I would say, JFK assassination podcast it's been going for many many years run by a canadian guy called leno sanic and he often gets jim d eugenio on who's oliver stone's um partner in crime these days and they often that well they do they just every week they talk about the jfk assassination they get a new author on you know you know the routine um so one day i was listening to that and they were talking obviously about jfk and this probably would have been about sort of march april 2020 and um Someone just mentioned, I, I almost turned off <laughs> the podcast because uh, they get to a letters section at the end of the, of the end of each episode. Yeah. And Jim reads out letters, which generally just praise Jim. And, and Jim deserves praise, by the way. He's a fantastic researcher on, on JFK. I've got a huge amount of admiration for him. But it, the letters tend to be, Jim, you're great and keep up the good work, which I'm not particularly interested in. So <laughs> I, was, I, I almost turned it off. <laughs> often wonder how my life would have gone the last three years if I did turn that podcast off. Uh, but for some reason, I kept listening to the letters. Uh, and then Jim read out a letter of saying, you know, how good he was. Uh, and he is good, by the way. I'm not having a go at Jim Eugenio. I think he's brilliant. Um, and at the end of this letter, Jim said, oh, and by the way, Jim, do you know anything about uh, the John Lennon assassination and the fact that the doorman was a Cuban CIA operative or something like that? And my ears just pricked up and I just went, hmm. John Lennon, CIA, Cuban, because obviously Cuban is that has those JFK affiliations. Yeah. Um, and Jim didn't know anything about it. So Jim went, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Um, uh, so I, uh, I went home and I, I started to Google. Uh, and of course, you quickly find out about Jose Padermo and his alleged connections to the bear pigs. And initially I bought into that. And obviously I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking about Jose Padua. Yeah, eventually. I will have to ask um, you about that. Yeah. 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 And I, I started to research and I, I just, because of my researching skills from my TV days, I, I'm, I'm sort of all right. I'm pretty good at researching and I know how to, how to, how to find stuff. Uh, so I, and I, I'm well aware that there's only one layer. Once you get into, um, you know, once you get past Google, uh, you need, you know, Google will only take you so far is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, and I knew that. So I knew you had to go deeper than that, um, which I did. And um, in the early days, early days and weeks of, of researching this, I, you know, I just started to not jot down some notes and, and 10 pages went to 20 pages, went to 50 pages. I think I got up to about 100 pages, 200 pages. I can't remember now, but it, it, it just started to expand, and expand, and expand. And the thing that the thing that first struck me, Matt, was the lack of detail. Um, there just seemed to be no specifics. You know, it's kind of there was, a, there was a lot of generalizations. You know, he got out, he walked past him, he got shot, he fell in the driveway, vestibule, garments area, lobby. It kept changing. No one was quite sure where he got to or where he fell. Uh, and it just seemed too vague for me. And that sort of troubled me. Um, and I thought, this just doesn't, there's something not right here. This is, you know, considering this is one of the most famous 
murders of all time and one of the most famous men of all time was murdered why isn't this you know event detailed properly what why does why 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 are the details so murky so i started to get a little bit suspicious and then from that point on i just thought right i i just need to keep going now because i i just thought i need to find out more and then when you start talking to people that's when things really start to open up so by talking to people, you mean actual people who were there? Uh, yeah. 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 The actual like police yeah. officers. And I'm, I'm just yeah. guessing it. police doctors, officers who were police there. Police officers, right? doctors, nurses, detectives, Dakota workers, people who need jobs. I, I just I just went for the whole thing and managed to get, get hold of everyone, basically, eventually. It, it, it took a long time. Um, and you have to talk to them. And you have to talk to them multiple times uh, because it was a long time ago. It was 40 years ago. Um, often people see documentaries and, and read books that, t- that tell them they did things and they start to take those things on themselves. So I think what, what you have to, when you do these kind of things, for me, I, I think you'll get one account of, of, of something and then you'll get another account from the second person. And you think, okay, that's now beginning to be solidified. There's two people saying it. If there's three people saying it, then you think, well, I'm really onto something here. And if those three people are, are, are from different spheres, so if you've got a cop, you've got a, a, a person walking by, just an innocent member of the public, and let's say a Dakota worker who are not connected, or very, it's very difficult to connect those three people. If they're all saying the same thing, then you know you're kind of onto something. You know, you, mm-hmm. you're kind of, this, this is probably going to be true. You, you, we're never going to know 100% because obviously there was no CCTV footage at the time. Uh, it was 40 years ago. There was a big cover up. Uh, there's been an awful lot of media misdirection and just lazy journalism. And I would suspect suspiciously uh, kind of muddying the water stuff that's been going on for 40 years. Uh, so you've got to get past all that as well. Um, but eventually, I think I've, I've I feel very confident now in myself that I think I've figured out exactly what happened that night. Um, with regards to who was behind what happened, well, that, that, that's a bigger story. But I, I, it, it just took me such a long time to actually figure out, Matt, exactly what happened, who was there, where they were positioned, and, you know, the mechanics, the actual mechanics. And, and I, I'm sort of 95% certain. You can never be totally certain because I wasn't there. Yeah, but I'm 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 very confident now that I'm pretty certain I know what went down that night, and, and that's the first place where you have to get to. You have to figure out where everyone was and what actually happened. Once you get that fixed, then you can start to figure out what was probable and who did what and how they did it and why they did it. Then you can start going to people's backgrounds and and you can kind of figure out motives and you can figure out cover ups and and it's it's a labyrinth case. I was saying this the other day to someone on their show. It, it, it seems so much smaller than the JFK case, which was, you know, done in an open air parade with hundreds of people, hundreds of witnesses. And oh. the Lennon one just seems minuscule in comparison. You know, there's just three or four people that were there at the time. Uh, a few cops turned up, went to hospital, died, died at the hospital, allegedly. A few people tried to save him. Good night, Vienna. It's all over. You know, very simple, but it's, it's really not. It's yeah. uh, it's far from simple, as I'm, as I know you know. Yeah, indeed. Um, so where we're talking. Start? <laughs> yeah, where do I start exactly? I, I've lived with this case for three and a half years. I go to bed every night, and pretty much every night I'm mulling over stuff. Especially that you know, as as you progress through it, new stuff comes in, and you're, it's just you're constantly your logical side of your brain is constantly whirring, mm. uh, and you get tired. It just you just get tired of it, and you, and you just kind of, and it's dark, you know. It's it's just a dark thing to do. It's and and you kind of get tired of the darkness, and, de- and you get depressed because you yeah. you can see all the dark uh, wheels and the mechanics working behind it. And when you get to know some of the people that you think are involved, it, it, it's just to spend time in in that world is is difficult. And, and I'm and it's it's exciting. Don't get mm. me wrong. Uh, and when you're uncovering new stuff and you think, wow, the world needs to hear this and I can't wait to tell the world this, um, that's great. But I'm not sure in hindsight, if I could go back in the time machine, whether I'd do it again. 
just because it, it's it's really draining. You get an awful lot of abuse. Uh, you know, I, I went I went mainstream in the Mail Online with a couple of articles, and, and the abuse yeah. was pretty full on, as I kind of expected, because as you said earlier, it's a very emotional thing, and people, you know, they they you know they map they chart their lives out with 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 music and it means a lot to them um so i think when they when they're told that someone so dear to them was killed in a way that they didn't quite know and understand and the wall was pulled over their eyes i fully understand why people get angry but the good news is i'm you know i'm at an age now i really don't give a flying what people think about me but it's it's more difficult for family members you know to to see that kind of stuff that kind of abuse yeah and i warned them i said look <laughs> I, I, you know, because I, you know, I knew what happened in the JFK researchers sphere and RFK, and I spoke to people like Tom O'Neill with his Chaos book with Charles Manson. I spoke to people like Lisa Pease with her RFK book, and you know, you, you kind of you, you get a feel of what's coming, uh, and, and, and there's a lot more to come. By the way, I think once the book comes out, mm. it's really going to put the cat among the pigeons. But I, I, I think once you do something like this, and once you start to uncover stuff, I don't know about you, but I just feel you have a duty to get it out yes yeah you, know, you, you, you just have to get yes. it out there yes. the information is king and and once you get that information you know you, you just can't I, i'm just not that kind of person who just sit on it yeah know, i had to i had to and I, I never planned to do a book i just kind of did it as a lockdown project just a little bit of interest something interesting to just get my teeth into while this strange house arrest thing was going on um and, and you know from there i did get to a point i think where i just thought i i, I have to keep going now I've, I've uncovered too much um yeah. and and that that's what happened so that's how i heard about you from that mail online article that you mentioned mm. that it came out it was published online in april 2023 i think Mm. Um, and I was quite, quite surprised actually that the Mail Online published it because it is the, the, it, that, that's the internet arm basically of, of the, the Daily Mail, which is the UK, as I speak, if I'm not mistaken, it's the UK's best selling newspaper. So I was quite surprised that some, something as mainstream as that would go with this, you know, would be kind of advertising your book, if you like, you know, taking something from your book, from your research, which is so against the uh, official narrative, if as it were, mm. of Lennon's killing it, that I was quite surprised by that. Um, I bet, yeah, I mean, I'll explain to you how it came about. It, it's There's no mystery to it. Um, because I swam in mainstream waters years ago, a lot of people that I've met and worked with in the 90s in news are, are still working in news. And working in television and working in research. So, so I know people who know people in the mail. And I said, look, can you reach out to someone high up in editorial in the mail and just see if they're interested? And, and someone did that for me. And they said, well, okay, it, this sounds interesting, but you need to come in and prove your case, which I had to do. So I had to go in there with all my, my documentation and, and my, my interviews and my audio and my video and everything and just show them all that stuff. And it, it took a long time. I had to sort of, you know, they, they weren't just going to take it on my word. They wanted to see evidence. Eventually, I managed to convince them that there was a lot of new evidence. and There was a lot of, you know, public interest stuff here. And uh, we, we did an interview and it, a lot of it was filmed. And, and, you know, they graciously gave me two pieces, which is incredible because it ultimately it's not about me. It's not about us researchers. It's about the information. And it's about, it's not just about the information. It's about getting the information out to people. That that has to be our number one goal when you're doing this kind of work. So when, when that opportunity arose and they kindly and graciously put those two pieces out, I, I was over the moon. Um, and I hope they'll do more in the future, but you know, they, that you're right. They're, they're massive. I think they're the biggest online kind of news outlet in the world, actually. They're very big in America, uh, yeah. made online. Um, so, yeah, that was wonderful. Um, and, you yeah, know, there was a big backlash. <laughs> I got yeah. a lot of abuse. But, you know. You're, you're talking mean, about uh, commenters, people adding yeah, comments commenters. to the end of the article. Yeah. yeah this was my yeah. fear, you see. This is what I thought might happen, you know. Um, the, you know, if, if you dip your feet in the waters of the mainstream media with, with stories like this, you're setting yourself up or even a more conspiratorial element of me might say that the the news agency itself is setting you up for a fall it's it's 
kind of putting you up as uh, as a figure to destroy a particular here you are for example coming at them with this alternative version of events to something that the you know that that has been suppressed by the mainstream for so many decades and here you come challenging it and the mainstream are giving you that platform it's almost as though they're setting you up to to bring you down does that or am i being too yeah, sp- I, I hear, suspicious yeah i think I, I think i think you are yeah i, I don't think they're that machiavellian I, I think with regards to just pull you up something you said there when you said suppressing they don't they don't suppress it i, I think that's a, that's a fallacy they just don't bother looking there they just don't think there's anything there to look at so unless you can bring it to their attention and I never would have got in there if I didn't know someone and knew someone in there. You know, it's, it's the, you have, you have to be given so this guy's credible. Come and listen to him. And, and that's kind of what happened in my case. But I, I don't think they were kind of, they, they don't sort of think, let's try him up and this is going to get a lot of clicks and a lot of abuse so we can just sit back and enjoy it. I think they actually believed they had something worth, worth telling the world. You know, it, it literally was that. And they were, they were as surprised about my new evidence as, as, as most people, they were like, oh, wow, okay, really? Oh, doctors and nurses said, what? what? Okay, wow, got any evidence? All oh, right, you got the interview. All right, let's have a listen to the interview. Oh, yeah, he did say that. Okay, we'll go with this. You know, they, they, and they did, they, they were, to be fair to them, they were proper and correct. They, they did their due diligence. They checked my evidence. They gave it some thought and thought, yeah. Uh, the, ultimately, the reason why we're not seeing more of this kind of stuff, I, I don't think that's a, I don't think there's any sort of Machiavellian plan. I, I just think they're just lazy. And, and they're, they're, there's, there's a sort of, there's a bit of cowardice in there as well. But, and, and a little bit of ego that if we did put on Oliver Stone's new JFK documentary series, we, we're kind of, which I think completely nails it, that Oswald couldn't have done it. It's kind of saying that for 42 years or, or JFK 60 years, we were idiots. We all bought into a lie. And I think ego does come into it. And I think most people who run TV stations and run media outlets are very uh, well-educated and successful. And they don't want to be told that they're, that they're very expensive education and worldly view of the world is wrong. Uh, and I just don't think they can go there. I just, I just think they're just, the world, they don't need to go there because they're having a good time. They're earning lots of money they're seen as a kind of, you know, sexy journalist or producer or whatever. Why, why would I, you know, uh, endanger all that by putting out something that people might call me a conspiracy theorist of? And, and that phrase, it really is a powerful phrase. You know, I've, I've seen people in TV who, when they think that phrase might come up, they don't even have to say it, but when they think they're, they're, they're beginning to get into a, a uh, project that might be called a conspiracy theory it's just terror terror and it's like it's like it's like that phrase is almost hypnotic and they just they just shut down and they move on and and it had to be brutally honest matt it's just cowardice they're just cowards they're they're just too scared to be called called a conspiracy theorist because they think they won't be credible anymore if that's the case and they know what happened to oliver stone they've seen that you know, and I just think they prefer just to stick their head in the sand and just stick to official narratives and, and enjoy their paycheck and enjoy their, you know, so-called, um, you know, prestige, uh, prestigious place in, in the in the kind of media pantheon. And uh, they're not going to put their neck on the line. So with regards to this Made Online article from April 2023, that's how you came to my my attention. And, and, and a lot, mm. I, d- I don't know how how it was greeted in the mainstream as it were i mean you've given me some clues there already that there were some Mm. people who commented at the end of the article where you can post in your comment you got a quite a lot of um uh, bad vibes from it but um within the alternative media uh, to use a phrase to use a term um it was getting shared a lot um and i was getting I was getting quite a few people emailing it to me um, and right. I, I saw it on various forums and, and blogs um, being shared, especially blogs and forums that um, are linked to music and are Beatles related with a bit of a conspiratorial element to it as well. So it was certainly being shared a lot. Um, and it, it does, uh, if I can read the headline to you, could the man jailed for John Lennon's murder be innocent New documentary says a second gunman could have fired fatal shots 
and questions whether Killer Mark Chapman was brainwashed by CIA. So there's going to be a documentary as well. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah. yeah. It, it's the, the documentary is has been much more difficult than the book. Let's put it that way, because when when you get into documentaries, you've got to you've got to work with lots of different entities uh, who all have different opinions. Um, so that that one's going to be. Uh, uh, it's more difficult for me to say exactly when that will come out. I'm, I'm fairly confident it will come out by next spring, but we'll see. But the book is definitely done. The book's finished. The book's coming out this this year, and uh, I can't wait. Um, now I know you know that I I co-present a Beatles related podcast called Magical Mystery Talk. Yeah, with- I've heard it. I've, I've heard it. Yeah, I heard you, you the two you did on the Lennon assassination. With Mark Devlin, co-hosts yeah, Mark Devlin and Desiree Hall. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I want to pick out some signposts. I'll call them signposts some, because, of course, you're not the first person to look into the killing of Lennon. It's been going on for decades in within the alternative stream, if you like. Mm, for sure. Um, going back decades. I mean, if we want to go back to 1981, I think it was, there was the uh, journalist and broadcaster Mae Brussel who began to look into it back then. And then, of course, we have, yeah, yeah, and and Fenton Bresler, a British-born barrister who wrote the book in 1989, uh, The Murder of John Lennon. He spoke to a lot of the protagonists, as it were, surrounding that event, you know, the the, the, the police that were there and even Yoko Ono, I think. And and, I'm not sure he got Yoko, but yeah, it's a great book. Sure. I, I looked in the acknowledgements of his book and he, he, he thanks Yoko Ono for some reason. So I don't know whether he yeah, spoke to I don't, her think, or... I don't think she gave him any, as far oh, as I right. can remember. He's, he's thanking her in the book, but I don't know, yeah. I don't know why he's Pretty sure she didn't, she didn't give any proper statements. But yeah, Trent and Brezza, Matt, is, I mean, he's... he's, he's he he's did the, the legwork, him, didn't him and, he? Yeah, well, he did some. I mean, him and May are, are first generation researchers for sure. Uh, yeah. And we all owe them a great debt of thanks. Remember, May's the person who got Fenton interest in doing a John Lennon book so May's the number one person I think you always had an instinct that something was wrong right from day one and of course um so that that's that's important and and Bresler Bresler was an outlier you know he was an early adopter and he he kind of you know he he was the first person to mention that Klein was not Klein was CIA though interestingly he didn't think there was anything wrong with that (laughs) He didn't sort of go, oh, that's kind of weird that this guy was... So he, he just kind of said it as a kind of reference. Um, he didn't go anywhere near the medical, which I thought was interesting, uh, or anywhere near it in regards to what really happened. I, I don't think he bothered digging any deeper than Lynn, uh, which the amount of damage that Lynn did is... I think that's a classic example where someone like Bresler didn't look beyond him. Cause yeah, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn so, Dr. So Stephen convincing. Lynn. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, Stephen yeah. Lynn, who was the man who for many decades claimed he was the man who tried to resuscitate John Lennon. And then it turns out some 10 or so years ago that actually or just over 10 years ago that no, it was all a lie. It wasn't Dr. Stephen Lynn. It was uh, yeah. Dr. Halloran. That's right. That's <laughs> so right. odd, so, isn't it? It, it was just, odd. Yeah, we we can get into that. I mean, Lynn, yeah, Lynn's yeah. just an embarrassment. There's, so yeah, I mean, that's yeah, one, sorry, carry on. Sorry, yeah, Matt, that, I, that's, I, I, that's one of the so-called signposts that I've got that I'd like to ask you about because, as I say, mm. this has been going on for decades. Many people have been looking into this in the alternative arena, if you like, for many decades. Bloggers, as well as Bresler and May Brussel, that have been various bloggers and podcasters, and now mm. yourself who've mm-hmm. put in the legwork into to putting this this book together um mm. now I'd, some of the signposts that i picked out here are some of them are or a lot of them or most of them actually um are signposts i've picked out from the podcast that i and desiree and mark devlin um, okay. uh, presented it back in 2020 maybe you can elaborate on them or, or maybe bring some clarity to some of them yeah i'll try um, i'll do my best okay for example there's the mind control aspect that that um mark mm-hmm. chapman was mind controlled he told barbara walters in an interview in 1992 he said i heard this voice saying over and over do it do it do it do it and i pulled the revolver out of my pocket in 1988 he said i looked at him lennon And he walked past me and then I heard in my head, do it, do it, do it over and over again. Do it, do it, do it, do it like that. I pulled the gun out of my pocket and I just pulled the trigger. Um, And then I think this is from Fenton Bresler's book, um, a quote from Fenton Bresler's book, according to Arthur O'Connor. This is a quote attributed to Arthur. Good old Arthur. Yeah, Yeah, he was 
commanding yeah. officer of the detectives at 20th Precinct of mm. the uh, New York police and who interviewed Mark after his, his arrest. He said, he's quoted as saying by Bresler, I think it was, it's possible Mark could have been used by somebody. I saw him the night of the murder. I studied him intensely. He looked as if he could have been programmed. That was the way he looked and that was the way he talked. It could have been drugs. And no, we did not test him for drugs. It was not standard procedure. But looking back, he could have been either drugged or programmed or a combination of both. And um, yeah, uh, also um, another someone else who Fenton Bresler, I think, again, this is taken from his book. He quotes Dorothy Lewis, who examined Chapman after he was arrested, um, he was um, psychologically uh, analysed uh, as a, a, a it was an order by the judge for Chapman to be analysed psychologically. Yeah, she's great, Dorothy. Just yeah. quickly getting in on that one. She was independent. She wasn't working for the defence or the prosecution. So Dorothy right. Lewis is incredibly she, valuable. And she was a clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University. She, she claims after examining him that it looked like Chapman was quote unquote under a command hallucination. That's what she said. Mm. Now I want to turn your attention to Milton Klein, who mm -hmm. um he was another of the doctors that was called in to assess Chapman. And I, I look when I looked into this for the podcast for my magical mystery podcast that we've talked about, um I noticed that there were some connections to the CIA's project Bluebird project which according to a document that I found online was designed to administer hypnotism and drugs for, and I quote, interrogation and personality control purposes. Now, at the time that we published that podcast, I quoted um, Klein as saying, with regards to creating a Manchurian candidate, he's, I said at the time that it was reported that he said, it cannot be done by everyone. It cannot be done consistently, but it can be done. Now, since then... I seem to recall that you've got a YouTube channel, The Assassination mm -hmm. of John Lennon, which I recommend people go take a look at. Just, just Assassination of Lennon. Sorry, Matt. Assassination just, of Lennon. Yeah. Pardon me. Now, I, I think you. you've actually got the quote from Milton Klein. So it's not reportedly. You've you've actually got the, the audio or the video of that. Or am I? Yeah. 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 He, I mean, bless him, little Milton. And he decided it would be a good <laughs> idea to go on a documentary in 1979, a year before John Lennon was assassinated and, and brag and boast in a couple of clips, I think it was an ABC documentary. He basically just looks straight into the camera and says, yeah, I, I can, I can brainwash someone to become a murderer in three to six months. I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, he, you know, he was bragging about the fact that he could do that. Um, and, you know, and, and he kind of he justified that by saying, you know, in wartime scenarios, I think it's a good thing. And the, the guy said, what, what would you, you know, classify a wartime scenario? And he's like, well, you know, it's up for debate, isn't it? So, you know, yeah. a, a, a heinous, evil crook uh who's who was done for perjury uh spent some time in jail for lying about his qualifications he, he he's he was it was he headed up a very large and nefarious hypnosis uh kind of how would you describe it organization uh where you had people like richard bloom another uh military slash hypnosis guy who who was an associate of klein who also piled into Mark Chapman's police cell with uh, with Bernard Diamond, who also worked on Siren Siran. So you had all these nefarious hypnotists, uh, Matt, Milton Klein, Bernard Diamond, um, and and um, Bloom, Richard Bloom, you know, just piling in there, shutting the door and having Mark Chapman all to themselves. Disgusting, really. Uh, and, and these guys were working for the defence. Um, allegedly. And was this uh, and, in the police station, or was this in the jail when he was being held? For the, this, this would have been. This would have been in Rikers. I think he was. He was moved to Bellevue the first week after he was arrested, and they realised that Bellevue. This is where Dorothy Lewis um, did did her first assessment of him. And I, I think once he was at Bellevue, I think there was a security issue, and they thought we need to get this guy to Rikers, which is a kind of you know a psychiatric prison, basically. And he moved often back to Bellevue when he had to, you know, talk to someone that was attached to Bellevue. But he moved between Bellevue and Rikers. So they had him all to themselves for almost six months, uh, five months for sure. Uh, it was kind of early June that he decided that God told him not to go to trial. But it, it was, it, as, as Fenton Bresler rightly pointed out, it was open house. You know, not only could all these guys go in there and shut the door and have Mark all to themselves. You know, people were allowed to ring in. Mark was allowed to ring out. 
it was it was reported that it was um, you know literally an open house. Um, so who knows who else got to Mark? I mean, the prosecution had a doctor called it, Doctor Emmanuel Hammer, who was another guy who was all about hypnosis and had and had nefarious links. So it wasn't just the defence, and obviously we can get into the defence and their links to the CIA with regards to a guy that worked on the defence team, a guy called David Suggs. Uh, who was part of Jonathan Marx's team, and he worked for a company called Donovan Newt and Irving and Leisure. Yeah, get into it. Were, yeah, tell us. Yeah, yeah I mean, they, they were basically the CIA's law firm. It was set up by Wild Bill Donovan uh, after the Second World War. Uh, even, even the CIA director worked there. Um, and it was a wash. It was known as, as the CIA's pet law firm. It was a wash with ex and current CIA spies. Um, and that was the law firm that suggested to Jonathan Marx. Uh, Mark Chapman's second lawyer, uh, that it might be a good idea to um, have David Suggs working on their team. And then somehow Jonathan Marks and David Suggs thought it was a good idea to put all these nefarious hypnotists into Mark Chapman's cell. Now, you, you, we, there's no evidence that David Suggs and Jonathan Marks were acting in any way you know, uh, nefariously. It, it may, they may have been completely innocent and they may just have been suggested to use these people and they went along with it because Jonathan Marks worked in the same building as Donovan Newton, Urban Leisure, which is 30 Rockefeller Plaza, which is a very plush building for a, a guy like Jonathan Marks to be working in at that time. Uh, he, he was an ex-DA prosecutor. He was a private lawyer at the time. Uh, so it was kind of strange that he got the gig. Uh, and he wasn't particularly experienced at, at being a, a trial lawyer, but that's that's the guy who got it. Uh, because the first lawyer who was appointed to Mark, who was appointed, who was a, who was a public lawyer, appointed by the courts, was a guy called Herbert Adlerberg, who got so many death threats that he decided that he couldn't cope with it anymore. So if, if you wanted to get someone in that you could work with, either explicitly or inadvertently, uh, that's you know basically what happened. They got rid of Adlerberg, got Marks in, Mr. 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Suggs then started to work for Marx. Suggs was a link to Donovan Newton, Urban and Leisure. And then from, from, I believe, that company, I believe that's where all these CIA-linked um, hypnotists were fed into Mark Chapman's cell. Do you have any idea about this first lawyer? What, how, what is, how, it's interesting, his yeah. personality? It's, was he a good yeah, guy? Did you like? I think he was a good guy. I, I think he was... It's interesting because if, if you I've, I've researched him quite deeply because I, I I think there was definitely a campaign to get him out. I think that I think if he was there, I don't think Milton Klein would have got into Mark Chapman's cell. Um, we can get into this in a moment. But if Mil, Milton Klein didn't get into Mark Chapman's cell, Mark Chapman would not have pled guilty, in my opinion. And I can explain why in a moment why I think that. Yeah, um, do that. And, yeah. I, <laughs> and I think um, they had to get Adlerberg out of the way. I think to get these kind of people into Mark Chapman's cell because I don't think Adlerberg would have had people like Milton Klein and Bernard Diamond in Mark's cell. Um, Adlerberg, when he first got the case, it, you know, it, it, there was a lot of reports that he, you know, he spoke to the press. He was very concerned about the Beatles fans. He was very concerned about phone phone calls. He was very concerned about some things that Mark told him. He said one quote to the New York Post, which was very chilling. He said, Mark told me something that if I told you, you know, it would turn your blood cold. You know, there's, there, there, I think there was stuff going on. There were mind games being played with Herbert Adlerberg's. Uh, sort of psyche and I think there was definitely a campaign to um, get rid of him and get him out as quickly as possible now at the time he often said no it wasn't when, when he left he was asked why he left I think he left after three days um, they, they sort of said why did you leave you know was it was it these so-called horrible phone calls that you had you know you had some nasty phone calls he's like oh no 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 there was no, no nasty phone calls no no I just left because I wanted to leave it was just too much for me uh, but later, later on in the 90s, he gave some TV interviews where he actually admitted that, yeah, there were some, you know, death threats, uh, phone call death threats, which I believe was part of, you know, a very calculated campaign to get, get him out of the way to get their guy in. Now, their guy being Jonathan Marks, again, I have to stress, Jonathan Marks may be innocent. He may not have known that he was being set up to work with David Suggs. And David Suggs might not have known that he was being set up to put in, you know, CIA mind control experts like Milton Klein. But at the end of the day, Jonathan Marks had used Milton Klein before in a, in a case a year before Mark Chapman. And he worked in the same building as Donovan Newton, Urban and Leisure. So I'd be very surprised if Marks, Sugg certainly knew what his law firm was. He, he must have known that his law firm was set up by, by the CIA's founder. He must have known 
that he was working with CIA spies. So, you know, Suggs, I'm sure, will say he had no idea what Klein and Diamond were getting up to. And, and you know, it wasn't his decision to put them in into Mark Chapman's cell. But at the end of the day, th- those heinous psychiatric hypnotists that got into Chapman's cell came via Jonathan Marks and David Suggs. They can't get away from that. I'm sure they'll say they had no idea what they were getting up to and they were decent men and blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, that's that's the chain that had to be put in place for that to happen. And they're part of that chain. So they've, they've got questions to answer for sure. And if my memory serves me correctly, pardon me if I've forgotten this, you say Jonathan Marks is working from the Rockefeller building. Yeah, 30 yeah. Rockefeller Plaza, which is a very plush building, which is where Donovan Newton, Irvin and Leisure were. You know, they had massive offices there. You know, it's kind of like Knightsbridge. You know, yeah, Kenton, Rockefeller, very I, interesting, you know, yeah, name yeah, to... I yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything there, but I, I think it, it's just weird that a one-man band, as Jonathan Marks portrayed himself as being back in 1980, one get that gig. You know, I spoke to some lawyers who said, how the hell did he get that? You know, he was just completely underqualified. He had no idea what he was doing. He's completely out of his depth, but he's the guy that was chosen. The court chose it. I'm fairly certain he was a private lawyer, so I'd quite like to know where the money came from um, to actually hire him to do the job. And you just can't get away from the fact that this one-man band guy was working in the same building as a CIA law firm, but then gave him a CIA employee, law firm employee and David Suggs to work with him on the case. And then some CIA consultants in mind control, hypnosis, MK Ultra, Manchurian Candidate kind of division get placed into Mark Chapman's cell via Jonathan Marks and David Suggs. It's, you know, they, these guys have got a lot of questions to ask. I'm sure they'll just say, we had no idea this guy was working on MK Ultra, but he was in a documentary a year before, boasting yeah. about it. So, and he was also working on a case for Jonathan Marks a year before Chapman as well in 79. So you're trying to tell me that he was on TV on a big documentary on ABC in America. And then when he went to see Jonathan Marks, either about the case he was working on before, which was a subway murder or, you know, the Mark Chapman case, are you trying to say that Milton Klein and Jonathan Marks didn't discuss that? You know? Oh, by the way, you know that CIA law firm that's down the, down the hallway? <laughs> I work for them. And yeah, I'm a consultant and I was a consultant on MK Ultra. It's kind of brainwashing <laughs> thing. But, and I was on a documentary last night boasting about it. But let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about golf. You know, yeah. clearly he knew. He knew who he was. He used him. He knew where he came from. He must have known his associations. Jonathan Marks did, did some interviews in the 90s where he looks very nervous and out of his depth. He's never spoken again. And I think that's quite telling. Uh, I think Jonathan Marks needs to answer a lot of questions, in my opinion. I'm not saying there's anything nefarious about the guy. I just want to put that out there. I'm not saying he's involved in anything dodgy or nefarious. But there's too many gaps and there's too many awkward questions that need to be answered about him and Milton Klein and his defense of Mark Chapman. Because remember, right from right from the off, Matt, Jonathan Marks just said, well, he's, he's clearly, you know, mad. And uh, we're going for that. And, uh, you know, insanity is what we're going for. Temporary insanity. It was a very strange thing to go for. Why was he temporary mad? Was it just, why didn't he just say insanity? Um, so, you know, he never once said... I'm looking into this. I'm going to go and investigate this. I'm going to get a team of investigators on it and just find out what really went on that night. It, 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 it never came up. But, you know, from day one, Jonathan Mark said, clearly he did it. We're going for insanity. Wish us well. You know, yeah. he, he just, he, he didn't do Mark. Uh, uh, you know, he didn't do a good job for Mark. And, um, I, you know, it's, as I say, he's got a lot of questions to answer. Mark Chapman, who went from... Um, not guilty to pleading guilty because of this voice from God. Yeah, let's talk got, about that. Yeah, that let's he got in jail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we've been told for 40 years that it was God, right? And, and there, there's a transcript from the court where the judge actually says to Mark, did God come and talk to you, Mark? And Mark said, yeah, it was God. This is what Mark said in the court, right? So that, that alone is bizarre, that an instruction from God. Oh, asking I didn't to know guilty. that. So it's like yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the line is fed to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, he, he did say it. Allegedly, oh, he rang right. up. No, sorry, I don't know if you did. But what happened was, to give you the chain of how it all happened, Mark rang up Jonathan Marks out of the blue about a week before they're going to trial. I think it was early June. And said, I want to plead. Yeah, yeah it, when he was in his prison cell, uh, police cell, I, wa- I want to um, plead guilty. And Jonathan Marks allegedly went, well, that's weird. Why are you doing that, Mark? And Mark said, because God, God told me, 
God told me to do so, right? So that, that was the kind of, that's it. And Jonathan Marks allegedly tried to talk him out of it. We don't know. Uh, then when Mark went to, went to court, when they went to discuss this with the DA's office there and, um, and Jonathan Marks and, and Daniel Schwartz, uh, a, a, a psychiatrist who was working on behalf of the defence, they all just had a little chit chat in front of the judge and the judge sort of said to Mark, and there's, there's transcripts of this, you, you, you feel God spoke to you, did you? And he went, yeah, I think it was God, and I'm happy to to plead guilty because this is God's instruction. And and the judge was a kind of Christian guy, and he went, well, yeah, you know, our president talks to God. I think he, I think the judge even said my sister talks to God, so it's all good. I'll, we'll go with God. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, you're not mad to think that. But what what's come out in my research is and this came out of transcripts that came from Mark Chapman's defence because Mark, Mark Chapman's appeal because Mark Chapman in the mid 80s decided to appeal. That's something that nobody talks about. Oh, that right. one's brushed up. Yeah, that one's brushed under the carpet. I think he realised he'd been played by the mid '80s and thought, "I need to get the bloody hell out of here." Um, and uh, what came out in the appeal was the actual truth of why Mark pled guilty is a little bit more detailed and a little bit more telling. So let me give you a little bit of context before I tell you what he what he actually said to Jonathan Marks. And the context is this. Um, in 1987, a journalist called Jim Gaines wrote three articles, which I'm sure you know about, very famous articles in, in People magazine about yeah. Mark Chapman, which all came from some prison visits that Jim Gaines managed to wrangle his way into uh, in the early 90s with Mark. I think it was kind of like 83, 84, 85. He spent two or three years in there recording him. And Jim Gaines has, has done very well out of these tapes, as has another journalist called Jack Jones, who's done very well out of his tapes. Um, and through these transcripts, you know, they did various articles, books and documentaries, okay? Uh, one of these articles reveals that Milton Klein uh, wanted to talk to Mark about his little people kingdom. Now, this little people kingdom was a kind of uh, imaginary world that Mark allegedly had in his brain. And Mark was the leader of these little people. And there was like a government and an army. And it was this big imaginary world that Mark had in his mind. You see, And this was something that Gaines revealed that Klein spoke to about. Nobody else. And if you talk to Mark Chapman's friends who knew him well, and if you look at all the early pre-87 Chapman literature, there is no mention of this little people kingdom. It only came to prominence after he started to talk to, Mark, uh, to Milton Klein. So that's interesting. I thought, okay, at, at the time, I didn't really put two and two together. But when you find out what Mark Chapman actually said, to his defense team and the reason the actual exact reason why he wanted to plead guilty and the exact reason is this which was revealed in his um, appeal notes he basically the, the night before he decided to plead guilty he, he envisaged a battle on his prison cell floor or, or police cell floor as it was uh, and there was the forces the little people forces of the devil and there was the little people forces of god and they were having this major battle that Mark was imagining on his cell floor. The little people forces of God won the battle. The devil's forces were defeated. And the little people's general allegedly got up into Mark Chapman's palm and whispered into Mark Chapman's ear, the little people's general of God, I want you to plead guilty. Don't go to trial. And this was the exact concept that CIA consultant Milton Klein put into Mark Chapman's head. So I believe this is a clear indication that Milton Klein was put in there explicitly to find a device to get Mark Chapman to plead guilty. Now, what's interesting is a device that he implied in his head, i.e. this little people's kingdom shtick. Now, what's interesting is when we were told by Jonathan Marks and his, and his defence team that he decided to plead guilty, the detail of it, i.e. this little people stuff, never came out. It was always just, and the judge probably didn't know this, it was always just portrayed as it was, uh, it was just God and Mark's a religious guy and he really, you know, he's, he's kind of, it's not really God, it's just Mark's conscience, you know, coming out and that's why he wants to plead guilty. You know, he sees it as God, but he just feels, you know, he wants to atone. It was kind of, it was, it was sold in that kind of way. But what they didn't say is Mark pled guilty due to a little people concept that was put in his brain explicitly by a CIA consultant called Milk Klein. And it's, 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 it was, it was ingenious, really. 
And you have to kind of admire it if it wasn't so evil. But as far as I'm concerned, Klein and probably the others as well were all put in there explicitly. And probably maybe Jonathan Marks and David Suggs had no idea about this. But someone wanted them to get in there to get Mark Chapman to plead guilty. They had to get him to plead guilty and not go to trial. Because if it went to trial, the case would have been thrown out in minutes, as far as I'm concerned, because of the medical, the forensics, Mark Chapman's background, the the so-called sham investigation. It all would have come out and the case would have been, as far as I'm concerned, would have been thrown out very, very quickly. So they knew it couldn't go to trial and they succeeded. Am I wrong in thinking, I, I, because I do remember mentioning this in my podcast with Mark and Desiree, that mm. once he pleaded guilty, even though there was this temporary insanity that was, as you mentioned, was um, presented by his lawyer, that he actually he was deemed fit to stand trial? He was, yeah. He was never um, portrayed as, as a, a guy who had a mental illness. Yeah, so, because yeah. according yeah, he, to the media, yeah. we're told that he was a crazed gunman. But according to the court, he was fit mentally to stand trial. So that just... Exactly. Kind of... And remember, you're right. And remember, he's still in a prison today for the same. Yeah. So what, what they didn't want, and that, again, I think that was deliberate. What you don't want is Mark in a psychiatric prison with psychiatric nurses and doctors who are independent and not nefarious, poking into his mind-controlled brain. Yeah, much easier if you got him writing in a six by four cell in a in a you know normal normal prison, which is what they managed to succeed to do. So another signpost I've got here, and that's and this brings us to Halloran, because I know you've <laughs> spoken to Halloran, or I'm aware many times, yeah, many yeah? times, yeah. Um, yeah. So according to the official account, and and please do correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm only going by what I've found on the internet and mm. in books and newspapers and but you've actually mm-hmm. gone out there and spoken to the protagonists so you can correct me but according to the official account which does change it, it does change as you say mm. as to what mm. happened that night chapman shot lennon in the back and this is what chapman said himself in one or two or more interviews he's always said it consistently so he's always said that he's shot him in the back i've certainly heard yeah. him in interviews say that according yeah. to the official narrative or the account is it hit the left side of his upper body um mm. but that's not what dr halloran says who is this doctor who actually saw john in the emergency room of the roosevelt hospital mm. um he says no it was four shots at the front and he's mm-hmm. you can find him on youtube saying this there are news reports and interviews yeah, with the yeah, man saying are. this um, is, so you've yeah, yeah. spoken to dr halloran about this before you go before i, I want to hear what you have to say about that but also mm. uh there's a william joseph gamble who was a policeman at the time who was on the scene um mm. shortly after the shooting and he stated as well and i think this is via fenton bresler i think quote this is a quote from his book joseph gamble william joseph gamble also said yes he had been shot in the chest that's the quote had been shot in the chest yeah so yeah tell me a bit more about dr halloran um okay um so what i one of the very early things i did in my investigation was i thought like jfk you can tell an awful lot about these kind of cases from from the medical evidence so the first the first doctor i i came across that I wanted to talk to, or actually the first doctor I managed to contact, because it's not easy getting hold of these people, was a doctor called Frank Veteran. Right Now, Frank Veteran was working as a surgeon at the Roosevelt Hospital in 1980, and he's come out in one or two documentaries. He was certainly in a VH11, and he did a big article in a Beatles magazine, tribute magazine, talking about how he tried to save John Lennon's life and how John Lennon was shot all down the left side, you see. So I thought, well, that's that's not the back. So he was the kind of first red herring that I came across. So I, I basically rang him up and I had a long hour chat with, with Frank Veteran. And if anybody wants to find it out, you can go on YouTube. Frank Veteran, bless him, did a whole video where he looks into camera and tells you how he tried to save John in his life. OK, if so you can actually find this online, Frank's, you know, there's a bit of an ego there. So anyway, after this hour long chat with Frank, I sort of came off the phone I just thought something wasn't quite right. Didn't Something wasn't sitting right with me. And then I, I saw a film called The Lennon Report very shortly after that. Now, this is a film, it's a dramatic film that came out in 2016 that tried to get to the bottom of what exactly happened at the Roosevelt and what doctors and nurses actually helped treat John and what nurses didn't. Um, so they kind of, uh, so I watched that film. And Frank Veteran wasn't in that film, you see. 
So I thought, that's weird. Why didn't they put Frank in there? Uh, and then I realised that the doctor that was treating John in the film was a doctor called Dr. Halloran, who I'd kind of knew, known about anyway, because Dr. Halloran came out in 2011. And the reason Dr. Halloran had to come out in 2011, to see listeners know, is in, from 1980 onwards until 2011, sadly, even to today, actually, he's still going on about it. There was a doctor called Dr. Lynn, St- Stephen Lynn, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, so Steve, Steve Fan, I don't know, it's a weird name. But Stephen Lynn uh, was the head of the ER at the time. Uh, he alleged for 30 years that he was the doctor who, who uh, treated John Lennon. And he famously often used to say, I held John Lennon's heart in my hands uh, very dramatically. Um, so that, that's, that's, that was the guy for 30 years who took all the credit for it. But in 2011, Dr. Halloran came out and said, no, Stephen Lynn's lying. He didn't actually do anything on John. He came into the room later, stood in the background, did nothing, saw the wounds, but didn't actually do anything. So you've got three doctors now. You've got Stephen Lynn for 30 years who took the credit and all the sort of documentaries and books talked about Stephen Lynn for 30 years as the main guy who helped save John Lennon. You've got Frank Veteran, this guy over on the side who came out a few years ago saying that he was involved. And then you've got Dr. Halloran, who in 2011 came out and said, no, I was the real doctor. And Dr. Halloran is the real doctor. I've had that verified by various people. So just before I tell you what happened when I spoke to Dr. Halloran, there was actually a, 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 another doctor, <laughs> a doctor called uh, Richard Marks, who was also there and did actually help Dr. Halloran try and save John Lennon's life. But Richard Marks came later. Amazingly and weirdly, Richard Marks was out near the Dakota with his wife that night, not working. When he saw all the uh, the hullabaloo at the Dakota, asked someone what was going on. They said, John Lennon's been shot. He's been taken to the Roosevelt. And Marks rushed to the Roosevelt and came in halfway through Halloran's efforts to save John Lennon. So Marks was there as well and marks amazingly even he lied he went to people magazine and said in years years later that he held john's heart in his hand but halloran just kind of you know joked with him and ribbed him when he came back to the hospital and said you know uh, here's the guy who saved john n's life and, and marks apologized to halloran for doing that and getting carried away and, and, and halloran said yeah don't worry it's fine so when i managed to you need to get all that context it's very confusing there were four doctors uh who said that they helped save john n's life but actually only Halloran was the main guy assisted by, by Richard Marks uh, with Lynn standing in the background. So you've got that context. So when I rang Halloran, I sort of, the first question I asked him, I'll never forget it. I said, um, why wasn't Frank Veteran in the Lennon report? And he said, he wasn't in the Lennon report because he wasn't there at the hospital that night. So, yeah. so, so oh, wow. I said, okay. So that guy was just lying to me for an hour. And he's put a one hour video online about how he tried to save John Lennon's life. And it's all it's all completely untrue. So that, that's interesting. And that was an early lesson to me not to believe everything I was told. Um, so then I said to Dr. Harron, well, just t- talk me through it. So he talked me through. John came in, tried to save his life, pumped his heart with his hands. Uh, couldn't save him. T- sort of 20, 25 minute effort. Uh, he came in with no pulse. Pupils dilated basically came in dead he said it was a, a kind of hell mary kind of you know situation really they, they knew there was very little chance but they kept trying with blood transfusions and all the rest of it um and then i remember i never forget it it was again very early on it must have been kind of june sort of may june time 2020 very early on in, in this whole process for me and i said to dr halloran so whereabouts in uh, in john's back was he shot because at that point i was still going yeah. with the uh, official narrative and I'll never forget the moment. I knew where I was standing. And I knew what I thought. He just said he wasn't shot in his back. He was shot in his front. And I just thought, I said, you do realise that the whole world thinks the opposite. And he went, yeah. He said, I've seen, I've seen people say that. He said, but they've got that wrong. He was shot in the front. So I said, whereabouts in the front? He said, well, he was shot in a tight professional grouping around his heart. He said three bullets around his heart, upper left chest, went straight through him and came out in a direct line of fire in his back. So he had four in the front, three out the back. And he said one of the bullets that was nearest his shoulder stayed in. So he had four in the front, three out the back, tight professional grouping. And in his, in his opinion, the shooter had to be sort of two, three feet away from John at best. He was close. Um, and it was, you know, a professional. He, he assumed Mark Chapman was a professional marksman. And when I told him that Chapman was kind of 25 to 30 feet behind John in the opposite direction, he said, well, yeah, that's, that's he, he was perplexed. Mm. And we saw, we both sort of went, well, I, I sort of said to him, well, what, what if 
John turned. I said, and looked at Mark. I said, could he have done it? He said, no. He said, no, not from that distance. Not with that type of professional grouping. He said, no. Not, he said, in my, and this was his quote, direct quote. Not, in my opinion, not even a Navy SEAL could pull that off with that so kind like, of cl- yeah, close like grouping of magic of bullets. bullets. <laughs> yeah, mag- yeah, yeah, the ma- yeah, yeah, magic bullets that can fly and change course. And yeah, well, it wasn't. It wasn't just that. It was just the professional grouping. They were just yeah. so close together. And he, you know, it's that was a very dark uh, driveway. And Chapman was using a, a point thirty eight. Remember, it's a revolver. As well. A very important point is a chamber. So it's not an automatic. So while he's plugging John in the dark from a distance, you know, you're going bang, pause, bang, pause, bang, pause. It, it, it's to believe that John turned and then allowed Mark to hit him four times in his upper left chest. You're having, you're having to believe that he's standing there stupefied, not moving an inch, allowing Mark Chapman to shoot at his heart. And then once he's done that, let's, let's just get to it. What the official narrative want you to believe, because it has to be done in the driveway, Matt. It can't be done inside because Chapman can't see inside the vestibule. So what we're being asked to believe is, if we go with what Halloran and the nurses said, and we need to get to the nurses in a minute, um, he after he turns around, looks at Mark, and by the way, John didn't turn around. We can get to that as well. There's a lot of evidence that John did not turn around and Mark did not call out to him, but they need to kind of have that doubt and that that kind of that scenario put out there because they know the medical evidence doesn't fit with the official narrative. So that's, I think that's been deliberately put out there that Mark called out to John. But anyway, let's go with it. So John turns around, gets shot four times upper left chest. What they want you to believe is, and maybe he was shot in the back, which is the official narrative. So you can believe either way. It doesn't really matter. Front or back doesn't matter. What they want you to believe is that John then walks up to a vestibule door, which is a glass panel door. Quite light. It is, by all accounts, it was quite a light structure. But you have to pull it open. And it was on a closer. 100% it was on a closer. So he pulls it open. John walks into the vestibule area, which is like a little porch area. He then walks up six fairly steep steps. He's now coming to two mahogany doors, which were often closed because it was a kind of sealed win- you know, area for winter. You wanted to keep the, you know, the reason why the vestibule was at the bottom of the stairs was to keep the cold out. So you'd assume, and people have told me that, co- that those doors were normally closed, but let's be kind and say they were open. So John now staggers through those doors. He then turns left and he staggers through a, a kind of saloon door, double saloon door, which is attached to the front desk, which is on the left in the lobby, okay? He's now into the open-planned concierge's front office, which has a window out onto the Dakota Dakota driveway. He's now in there. He sees the concierge, Jay Hastings. He says to Jay Hastings, I've been shot, twice, allegedly. I've been shot, I've been shot. He then staggers on past through this front office into a back office, and then he decides to collapse face down, and dies. That is what the official narrative wants you to believe. Now, while we're on the doctors and nurses, when I spoke to Halloran, I said to Halloran, I said, look, is there anyone else I can talk to who will verify what you said? He said, yeah, talk to Barbara Cameron and DeSoto. They were the two nurses that assisted me through the uh, through the operation that we were trying to say, John, and they, they took John off to be washed and, and bathed and, 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 and shrouded. So talk to them. So Richard Marks is dead. So I can't talk to Richard Marks, which is a shame. Uh, Stephen Lean has been, you know, uh, called out as the liar that he is. So I wasn't going to bother talking to Stephen. Yeah. Uh, so I, I rang up Barbara and Dee, lovely, no-nonsense New York nurses who'd been, at that point, been there for quite a few years, as a Dr. Halloran, by the way. So these were very experienced professionals. And in late 70s, early 80s, uh, New York, they, they said, you know, it was a very violent city at the time. And they'd seen gunshot wounds and stabs and all the rest of it pretty much every day, every night. You get you get someone in with a gunshot wound, so they knew how to figure out what an entrance and exit wound was. And I said to them, "So what, what did you think?" They said, "Well, hundred percent shot four times, upper left chest, three coming out the back, hundred percent." They said, "There's no, we know what an entrance wound looks like, we know what an exit wound looks like, and the one thing that they said that corroborates with Elliot Gross's autopsy." is that John's left subclavian artery was completely blown away. And a lot of the other vessels and veins around his heart were also blown away. So his heart would have had real trouble pumping blood instantly. 
uh, and his left side, because your left subclavian artery operates your left arm, he would have lost all feeling in, in his left arm and his left side instantly. So I said to them, can you, you know, what happened? They said, well, D initially started to help Dr. Halloran, save John, when he's on the, on the gurney in the ER room. Then Barbara came a few minutes later. There was another nurse there called Eilish Egan, an Irish nurse that's very little often talked about. Uh, I've not managed to find her. I think she might be dead now. But they both nurses confirmed to me that Eilish Egan also verified what they thought, four in the front, three out the back. Uh, and they said when John was called, when they called it and they couldn't sadly save John, it was it was Dee and Barbara who took John off to another room to wash him uh, and, ba- and ba- you know, bathe his wounds and wrap him in linen, which they did, which gave them both a very clear uh, view of John's whole body, legs, arms, back, front, the lot. And they could see because all the all the gunk was gone. They'd stitched up the side of John where his heart was, where Dr. Halloran put his hand in to try and pump John's heart. And by the way, Dr. Halloran confirmed to me that when he did that, it didn't affect the wounds that were above his heart, yeah. which is something that people might say, oh, you know, when they were messing around and trying to save his life, the wounds might have got all messed up. No, the, wound, the wounds were very clearly seen by everybody. So when they washed him and they, lit, they wrapped him in linen, a very strange thing happened. Uh, Elliot Gross turns up the uh, I would call him a disgraced chief medical officer because he's had multiple accusations of falsifying autopsies but you know that's just my opinion he uh, he never actually got prosecuted for any of those allegations but there were many allegations but anyway this little guy turns up Elliot Gross I'm the chief medical examiner I'm going to be doing the autopsy on John Lennon I want to see his wounds right now and the nurses say well why he's wrapped it's disrespectful you're going to get him in the morning you're going to get him in a few hours. Why do you want to unwrap him? He said, no, I want to see his wounds right now. Unwrap him. Which was bizarre. A chief medical, they'd never, ever seen a chief medical examiner come in the ER and ask to do that, ever. Um, so they thought that was really weird. Sometimes they go to a crime scene, which I'm sure we've all seen in various cop shows, but they never go to a hospital because they know they're going to see the wounds anyway when they do the autopsy a few hours later. So they, they, there was a lot of arguing and eventually they kind of believed him because they just couldn't believe that this guy was who he said he was asking to do what he was asking to do. So they unwrapped John. They sat John up. I hate to be graphic here, but you know we need to get the historical truth out. They were very upset because John started to bleed out again from his four wounds at the front and three out the back. Gross walks around John in a very silent uh, manner, just observing the, the, the seven wounds, four front, three back. And then he leaves. He walks out the room. And they had to wash Johnny and they had to shroud him again, which means those two nurses got to see John's wounds up close twice with no impediment, no blood, no stains, nothing in the way. So they know and they're both 100% sure what those wounds are. So they're absolute, these nurses are absolutely perplexed and they feel... I wouldn't say betrayed is the right word, but they, they, they just can't understand why the whole world can't get this wound situation right. And when the Lennon report was being made, this is really interesting. The producers of the Lennon report were discussing the script with Barbara and Dee and, and Dr. Halloran. And they sort of talked about you know, the fact that John was shot in the back. And Dee and Barbara argued with them quite a bit and said, no, that's not right. You, you can't put that in there. It's just not true. Why are you putting it in there? He was shot in the front. And the producer or the writer apparently said to them, well, that's what Wikipedia says. <laughs> Wikipedia says he was shot in the back. It gets funnier. <laughs> and, then, and then Barbara says to, the, oh, to the writer, yeah, it gets better. Barbara then says to the writer, well, Wikipedia wasn't in the room that night when we were trying to save John Lennon. <laughs> um, so that was, that was just brilliant. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, to this day, they, they just can't understand why this lie about John's wounds. See, they, they, they and Halloran just assume John turned. You see, they, they, don't, they don't think there's anything to fur here. They just think Chapman must have been two or three feet away from John. John must have turned around and, and, John, and John died in the driveway. And then when I say to them, no, John went on this fantastical journey, <laughs> they, they find it almost comical. They're like, no. So the guy with those wounds would have died instantly. He would have dropped instantly. So the key question here now is, Matt, is how John Lennon was found in the back office lying face down on a rug bleeding out. That's a really, really important question. And if 
Chapman was behind John when the shots fired and the shots came directly hit him in the chest and came out the back. That then suggests that there must have been other people who shot John Lennon. And maybe in my Chap- opinion. Yeah, in and Chapman opinion, didn't yeah. actually do it. Let me just point out also that, as you say yourself, I don't know if I've got the quote right. I was listening to to you as you were talking about this, explaining this, and I, I wrote down in pencil, I might have remembered it wrong, but Halloran's quote is, when he looked at the wounds, it was tight professional shots. So mm-hmm. let's let's just... Um, it, let's just uh, point out here that Chapman was not a professional marksman, was he? Well, well, to be he, fair, I mean, he fair, wasn't he, trained, was he? To be, he, uh, he wasn't. He wasn't trained military style, and he wasn't trained uh, police style. But he did do security training, pistol uh, sh- uh, firing a year before. He did right. go on a course where he, and apparently, he was a surprisingly good shot. Okay, so it's what, possible you know, that it, it, I'm not, you know, if, if if he could, he he, he would be able to 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 um fire off I, tight I think, professional yeah. shots quote no unquote. no not from that distance in that in that in right. that dark driveway in my opinion but yeah. it'd, be, it'd be very easy for me to say oh no he had no pistol training yeah. he did have pistol training right. but he only okay. had security he only had security guard training and we yeah. can only go by uh un, unverified reports that he did quite well in in, in that kind of uh, security guard pistol training a year earlier but he, here's what's interesting is because he did work as a security guard, so he yeah, did, yeah, and, yeah. and an armed one in Hawaii, yeah. the, the, you know, before the before the assassination. Yeah. So he, he he knew his way around around pistols for sure. Yeah. Um. But wh- whether you could then call that kind of guy who just had a kind of security guard rudimentary pistol training, yeah. shooting at a target, no doubt in a field, whether that's a guy who can achieve four tight professional groups around John Lennon's heart. I mean, it, according to David Halloran, from that distance in the dark. Not even a Navy SEAL could pull it off. And, and David Halloran was a highly experienced surgeon and doctor who'd seen multiple. And they, they all said one other thing as well. They said it was a small bullet wound going in at the front and much larger coming out, much larger coming out at the back. So they knew how to see an entrance and exit. They knew how to read an entrance and exit. And also we have to remember another thing. Again. The bullets that Mark Chapman was allegedly using, hollow point bullets, they're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to pass through. They're supposed to blow up inside an individual and stay inside the individual. They're not supposed yeah. to pass through in a direct line of fire. So the bullets that Mark was allegedly using weren't supposed to do that. So let's let's get to while we're on it, let's get to the turning around yeah. myth. Um, it's kind of the way they do the myth, and it was done by Chief Detective James Sullivan uh, very early on when he did a press conference uh, the night of the murder. He basically said. Uh, Mark Chapman called out to John Lennon, right? That, that's the myth that they wanted to, to seed because they knew, I think at that point, Sullivan probably got the, the heads up from uh, Gross that John had entrance wounds in his front, right? So they knew there was a problem because everyone, including Mark Chapman, to this very day thinks he shot him in the back. So that, that was a big issue. So I think the Mark calling him out uh, fantasy was was seeded to kind of square away and put doubt in the well maybe John turned and he got hit in the shoulder or he got hit a bit in the front and a bit in the back they were keeping their options open is basically what they were doing so where where is the evidence where's the proof that Mark Chapman called out to John Lennon well there's none because the first bit of proof we need to get into is Mark Chapman himself who has never said again in 43 years that he called out to John Lennon you think Mark might know this um, but Mark has um, has been quite clear that he um, that he never did that. He's never said it. And, and, and why would he lie about that? You know, surely he would just. It's no it's no odds to Mark. You know, he he killed. As far as he's concerned, he shot John Lennon. So whether he shot him in the front or the back doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> what odds yeah. would that be to Mark to lie about? What's he got to gain to lie about that? So the we we know from the doorman. Jose Padrone very little because Jose's statement is still being concealed by the DA's office and the NYPD. Uh, so we don't quite know what Padermo said about whether Mark called out or not. Um, but we do know one thing. I've, got, I've managed to get hold of the lead detective, Ron Hoffman's notebooks, and there's lots of interviews in there. Sadly, not an interview with Padermo. Boy, would I love to see that. Um, mm. But there is many with Yoko Ono. And one that she says... Uh, quite clearly, uh, one one of her more coherent ones out of the five that she gave 
was that they walked in, they heard a noise in the street, but they didn't turn around. And it's very important to note here at this point that Mark Chapman, uh, that um, Yoko Ono, sorry, has never said that she saw Mark Chapman shoot her husband. Never. And she's had 43 years to do it. And if you think about it, it'd be very easy for Yoko to say that because nobody would doubt her. Because we know Chapman was standing by the sidewalk. We know that. There's a cab driver who saw him there. There's a couple of people. There's another woman, Nina Rosen, a dog walker who saw him there. There's a couple of people across the road in the Majestic who looked out the window and saw him directly there after gunfire. So we know kind of roughly where Mark Chapman was standing. And Chapman yeah. said himself he was standing by the sidewalk, right? Just a couple of paces in into the driver. Do, so we, do we know Chapman. about the cab driver? I mean, I know this was something that myself and Desiree, actually Desiree picked this up in our podcast that we did yeah. in 2020. Yeah. She was wondering, she was a little bit suspicious about the cab driver. Oh, do yeah, do yeah, we yeah, know, yeah. yeah, do do we know whether the cab driver ever gave a statement, a witness statement? Well, do yeah, we... yeah he, he did. And I've spoken to him. So we'll get on to him right, in a minute. Okay. I've spoken to Richard Peterson. I'll tell you all about Richard. But let, let me just quickly finish this. Yeah. So basically, we know where Chapman was. We know where Lennon was. We know where Yoko was. And remember, you've also got a concierge, Jay Hastings, who has his window open, who says he heard the vestibule door open and he heard gunfire, right? Jay Hastings has never said, I heard Chapman call out to John Lennon, okay? So you've got, what you've got is you've got Yoko Ona saying they didn't turn around. You've got Chapman never saying he called out to John. You've got Jay Hastings who can't hear it in his window. But you did get a guy who has now come out to me and said that Chapman called out. Now, this guy is called Richard Peterson, right? Now, Richard Peterson's a very interesting individual. He's, uh, he's quite old now. He's a gay black man who was taking two, as he calls them, gay passengers. He called them a, a more derogatory term, which I won't go into. But he basically said he had two gay passengers that he was driving to uh, a party at the Dakota. And he said he pulled up behind... John and Yoko's limo, and one of his passengers said, oh, look, there's John and Yoko getting out of the limo, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's kind of, he doesn't have a view inside the driveway at all. What Peterson said at the time was, is that he saw Mark Chapman standing there. He saw John and Yoko walk in, very, very light on detail. Doesn't talk about the doorman, doesn't talk about who went in first. But he said he saw Chapman raise a gun and start firing, and then put the gun down, uh, take out, take take off his coat, take off his hat, start reading the book. Now, the, the problem with that is, we know from Chapman in the official narrative, and from and, and another witness called Nina Rosen, that Padermo was there, and he came up to Chapman after he was firing his gun, and, and allegedly shot the gun out of Chapman's hand. So, the fact that Peterson suddenly doesn't um, doesn't remember Padermo makes his statement look a little bit shady at that point. Now, this is his original statement, remember, not what not what he said to me. Uh, so in that in that original statement, he said um, he couldn't see John because at that point, John was near the vestibule. He said out of his sight. But he, he did see Chapman fire. Now, the problem is, is the timeline. here. See, Chapman firing and then dropping his gun, taking his coat off, taking his hat off, reading the book. That that's not what he did. He had an altercation with Padermo first. We know this. So Peterson's kind of I think he's read parts of what people said happened and he's kind of gone with it and embellished it i think he probably did see chapman i think he might have even seen chapman raise a gun and fire but i don't think he saw everything i don't think he saw um uh, padermo come over because we, we, we have other witnesses who say that after gunfire they saw a yellow taxi screech off down the road and i think that's what peterson did i think he basically saw chapman standing by the sidewalk, which is important because that we need to have other witnesses placing Mark there because we don't have many. And I think he saw Chapman firing blanks. And I think he saw maybe even Paderma start to walk over. And I think he panicked. I think his passengers probably panicked. They said, get us the bloody hell out of there because the gunfire was very mm. loud in, that, in mm -hmm. that driveway. And I think he sped off. And I think he came back. And I think when he came back, I think he picked up from people like the doorman and Sean Strube and various other Chinese whisper type characters what kind of went down. And I think he called himself a witness because he partly was. And he is, you know, considered by the NYPD and the DA's office as an important witness. Though he didn't actually see John get struck by bullets. Now, here's what here's the problem with Richard Peterson. He's now starting to add stuff. 
Because now what he said to me was, is, and this is something he didn't say back in the day, is, oh, yeah, I heard him, sh- I heard Mark call out to, um, to, to John. And I said, well, you didn't say that back in the day. Why are you saying it now? Oh, I, I don't know. I must have forgot about then. But, yeah, I heard him. Because he's obviously read that in 40 years, right, that this is the narrative he called out. And he's adding it. He's adding stuff now. He's adding stuff that he didn't say originally. And then I said to him, is there anything else you can now recall, Richard? He said, uh, yeah, now you mention it. He said, um, <laughs> when John went in, um, you know, I saw, uh, I saw him nod at Mark and Mark nod at John. Again, something he never said in his original statement. So what Richard Peterson's doing is he's embellishing, which is what something an awful lot of people do in this case that I've spoken to. They just add little bit extras just to make themselves a little bit more interesting and a little bit more into the story. But I think I'm fairly convinced uh, that Peterson didn't see as much as he said he saw. Uh, And I think his statement, he also told me some other things which are so outlandish that happened to him in the police station that I won't go into it now, Max. We'll be all day talking about it. Yeah. But it, it couldn't have happened. I know yeah. that for a fact. So Peterson is the kind of witness that I would call, let's be kind here, unreliable. Yeah. What about so the limo driver? Um, because this was another, it's another of my signposts. This is another of um, Des Ray's doubts when we talked about this in our po- podcast in 2020. She wanted, she wasn't aware of, and I'm not aware of anything coming from the limo driver who dropped off John and Yoko. Yeah, was, did that yeah. limo driver ever give a statement? What did the limo driver see? Who was the limo that's, that's driver? A, a very good question. I know who the limo driver was who didn't turn up. Uh, when they were supposed to go to record plant and Chapman got his alleged autograph. I know who that guy is and I'll reveal who he is in my book. And he actually came out with some very interesting testimony about what Mark Chapman and Paul Goresh were saying and doing and how Mark Chapman was acting leading up to the murder. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll reveal all that in my book. So record the, plant is the studio where John and Yoko were recording. That's, where that's, they got, that's right. Yeah. And, that's right. and they came Paul out Goresh, at half five. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Paul Goresh basically was standing outside Taking photographs. Chapman, taking photographs. Taking photographs. Very dodgy man. Uh, yeah. Please read my article. Bit of a hanger on. A hanger on. Stalk- who... I'd call him a stalker. And, and I think he's a, a very nefarious character. I, I, I don't believe, you know, the, the way he's been made out as John's best friend is frankly disgusting. John he, he, stand he, just, him. he yeah, even yeah. even pretended to be a TV repairman so he could get inside John Lennon's apartment, didn't he? Uh, just, just, a, just a serial liar. Uh, basically a guy who stalked John for profit. He was a, a serious Beatles memorabilia buyer and seller. I, and I think the fact his van was parked outside there for, for many months before the murder, a, a man of great interest to me with regards to potentially someone who was working for people he shouldn't be working for. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a lot of questions to ask. I do a big article on Paul Gresh. Please go to my Substack, David Williams. Yeah. Got Substack. I'll, I'll mention that too. That. When we sign this yeah, off, so, yeah. So, yeah. Well, when did we get to him? I'm, I'm getting slightly off track. Yeah, here. Uh, we were talking about oh, the, cab, um, oh, the, the limo. Yeah, yeah, yeah and the so limo. The limo yeah. driver, so I know who the limo driver is who was their normal limo driver. I know his name, and I'll reveal it in my book. And I basically know what he said and saw because he turned up late after the Lennons got into another car with the radio producer. They were having doing an interview with earlier in that afternoon, and they went off to the studio. They basically catched a lift. And the actual limo driver who was late turned up and he gave a statement to the police saying, yeah, I turned up and they were gone. They already gone to the, um, to the studio. But I, I, you know, I, I interacted and chatted to Mark and um, Goresh and he gave some very interesting insights into the dynamic between Mark and Goresh and, and Mark himself. So I'll, I'll reveal all that in my book. Brilliant. I, I'm fairly certain that he is the limo that picked them up. The same guy, because it was very much a regular driver they used. I'm pretty sure and sure he's the guy who picked them up that night at at, at, uh, at the record plant and, and drove them home and delivered them outside at, t- at the fateful hour at 10:50 p.m. I can't say that for certain because in the in the police records it doesn't actually verify that he's the guy, but I'm fairly certain he is, and he's alive. This guy, he's out there. Yeah. Um, can't I haven't managed to catch an interview with him yet, but I, I'm very very keen to talk to him. Yeah. Very keen to talk to him. Because, yeah, I'm you know, not surprised. He, yeah, he may <laughs> know stuff. I'm not sure how much he'll know, to be honest. He'll, he'll be able to tell us more about what John and Yoko were talking about, obviously, maybe uh, on the drive home. But he also hopefully will be able to verify who got out of the limo first, because incredibly, that's still up for debate. 
And why did the limo stop at, on the curb when it could have driven up oh, into okay. un, into the yeah. archway? Because you could drive up there, couldn't you? With, you what, could. This, so this why is did they stop myth. outside in public on the curb well, when it could have driven this, them into the building? You know. Well, this is a this is a bit of a myth that that was nefarious. I spoke to a guy called lovely guy called Mario Casciano, who's who was a kind of friend slash assistant slash fixer for May Pang and John Lennon when they were together. When they were an item, and, yeah. Yeah, and Mario's a lovely guy. So Mario's a kind of New York guy, and he knew the Dakota well, and he often used to go into the Dakota and run errands, you see. So he knows that building inside out and had known it for a long while. And he told me, and I believe it, uh, because other people have verified this as well who work at the Dakota, it wasn't the norm for a limo to go up that driveway because it was so narrow. Once you drive up there, it's really hard to reverse back out again. You've got your your wheels caught on the very high curbs. So it, it was the norm to drop them off outside on the pavement. So that there's nothing nefarious about that. That, that. That's a myth that needs to be put to bed. Okay, well, I, I, some another signpost, and this is, again, thanks to Desiree and her looking into it, and she mentioned this in the podcast um, mm. that we did in 2020, was, so according to the official account, we've got John was hit four times, as we've said, as you've said, um, and one bullet went astray, so we're told, mm-hmm. and instead hit a window of the Dakota. So that's five shots. So that's four hitting John and one going astray. This is what we understood at the time we did the podcast and what Desiree uh-huh. talked about. Uh-huh. So there's four. So that got John. Plus, um, yeah, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. So that's four <laughs> it's, that it's hit confusing. John. It's confusing. <laughs> it is. I know. Um, I've, been, so, I've been doing it for three years, Matt, and I'm still confused I by know. it. So it's four hit John, one went astray, so that's five. But Desiree yeah. pointed out in the podcast that there was there must have been seven because no, were, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Let me stop. Let me another stop you there. three were found. So Yeah, let me stop you there. Uh, yeah, I mean you're right. It is really confusing. I think the seven one of the big problems with seven is that number is Lynn, God bless him, when he came out and spoke to the press outside the Roosevelt in his pristine white coat, um, <laughs> which uh, he, he said to, uh, he said to uh, the press that John had seven wounds, right? Which a lot of people ran away with and went, well, how do you get seven bullets out of a five revolver gun, right? Yeah. What he meant was with seven wounds, four in the front, three out the back, right? Which is fine. A little bit, you know, unclear on detail, but we'll, we'll give him a buy. On the on the ground, right? There, there, there is, there's one myth that has kind of been perpetrated that the, the one that Mark missed, the bullet that Mark missed, because Mark has always consistently said four hit John, one didn't hit John. Strange detail that, that Mark could remember that. Because remember, Mark didn't yeah. actually remember what the bullets were doing to John. Mark's never said he started to stagger or he twisted or he turned or he screamed. Mark just sort of goes, yeah, I was sort of pulling... I was sort of aiming and firing. And I, I remember, I don't remember, actually he said, I don't remember aiming. I don't remember pulling the hammer. I remember thinking, this is weird. These bullets are working. And I don't really know what happened to John after I hit him, which just is the most bizarre thing for a cold calculator killer to say. He's just hit someone in the back four times. But anyway, let's get to the bullets. Um, Mark has always consistently said that out of the five shots that he fired, one missed John. Not quite sure how he knew that, uh, but that's what he's always said. So people have tried to figure out where that stray bullet went, quite rightly. The bullet in the office window, i.e. Jay Hastings' concierge window, which is behind, it's like a bay window that comes out behind the vestibule. There, there was no bullet in those windows as far as I know. I've spoken to people like Jay Hastings and Joe Manny and, and cops who were there in their office and the lead detective. There was no bullet, according to all of those people, in that window. Um, I spoke to Joe Manny and said, were there any bullets in the, in the, in the sort of walls, any ricochets? Same, same to the cops, same to the concierge. They all said, no, it was weird. There was no bullets in the walls or the bricks or in the window behind the vestibule. Now, in the vestibule, that's a different case. In the vestibule, there are two glass panel doors. There's one you can see from the street that Mark Chapman could see. Then there's a kind of little divider in the middle of that door. And then there's another door behind that door, para, almost parallel, but slightly at an angle that you can't see from the street. And it's kind of like a little kind of, I don't know, like a little kind of triangle phone box in a way, a kind of little wooden porch. Now, the ones that Mark Chapman could see and the one that you can see from the street, the ones that Mark Chapman could feasibly hit 
has two bullet holes in and everybody that was there and you can see it there's there's plenty of images now of those two bullet holes in that door um th these images can be found online quite easily there's one very famous associated press picture of them and there was a freedom of information uh, act given to the da's office where they released another picture where you could see it from behind that door and you could see clearly those two bullet holes they're quite low down which makes no sense when you consider john was shot in his upper left mm. chest so if you're asking me to verify uh, how they got there, uh, I, I have a few theories that I put in my book, but nothing that I can say concrete. Whichever way you go, whether you go with him shot in the back, whether you go with him shot in the front, whether you go with uh, Elliot Gross's autopsy findings, those two bullet holes shouldn't really be there. And one thing I can say about those two bullet holes is they, and I've got this verified from everyone that was there, and including the cops, there was no blood splattered on those glass door on those glass panels so if it was shot through jo if if they were shot through jo if it basically if if it was bullets in the driveway that went through john's back and then through his chest and then as he kind of stumbled down they then went into the glass doors you'd expect a little bit of blood wouldn't you I, I think, or maybe not. Maybe the blood got caught by his yeah. shirt and his leather jacket. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But there was no blood spray. So that's kind of weird. And they're also too low down. So that's kind of weird. If they came from, from Mark shooting John when he's inside the vestibule, again, they're too low down. They, they kind of would have shot John in his lower back, kind of lower stomach area. So it, 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 they're not where John's wounds were, as far as we know from what happened, the nurses say. So again, those two bullet holes are a complete anomaly. Now, I'm pretty sure I know how they got there. I've got a theory, which I'll reveal in my book. But there is also another, I don't know if I can even call it a bullet hole, but in the door behind that door, there is another cracked window, which looks like someone's thrown a stone at it. So it's possibly one of the bullets that went through the first door and then went into the far door, because it's not really a hole. It's kind of... It could have been caused by a bullet, but I'm pretty sure a bullet would have just passed through that glass, which would have been tough on glass for sure, but a bullet would have gone through it. So it's looking like that hole was 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 actually made through a bullet passing through one of the other doors or passing through John and then hitting that door. So you've got three, you've got two holes and three bullet marks on those two doors. And you've got four holes in John, right? And you've got one bullet that stayed in John and you got one bullet, uh, and you got three bullets that passed directly through him. So, you know, if if you can work out how that all figured out from a forensic point of view, you're you're a far better man than me, uh, Matt. We can take we can take a guess at it. But here's where things get really nefarious. I've managed to get hold of a morgue receipt, which was in uh, Detective Hoffman's papers. Thank goodness. Uh, and what that morgue receipt said was fairly plainly, is that. At, at the uh, autopsy, Elliot Gross put into evidence two bullets that were found on uh, in John Lennon. One was found um, in his neck, which is a kind of area that shouldn't really have been shot if you go with what Dr. Haller and the nurses said. And one bullet was found in his leather jacket. But here's where it gets even more nefarious, um, Matt. One bullet was clearly a mushroomed uh, hollow bullet, which is what they do. Hollow bullets always mushroom out when they're shot into someone. Yeah. And the other bullet was just a normal non-mushroom bullet uh, that was allegedly found by, um, by Elliot Gross at the autopsy. So you've kind of – two bullets have been found. Three bullets are missing. When I said to, Doc, uh, to Detective Hoffman, did you find shells of spent bullets – he couldn't answer me that, uh, that question. He couldn't recall. Uh, but he did say they found five empty shells, but he couldn't recall. And to this day, I look, look for all the evidence vouchers, the guns in there, and there's various other things in there, but there's no spent bullets. So what happened to the spent bullets, I cannot tell you. So the, the, the bullet damage forensics on the scene is very unclear. And there were no men in white suits, Matt. Uh, the, the blood was mopped up later that night, uh, earlier, I think sort of around about sort of five, six o'clock in the morning the next day. 
a guy called um, Joe Grezik came up and mopped the blood up. Uh, and basically the Dakota driveway um, residents were allowed to walk in and out of that driveway the very next day. Um, and with regards to the vestibule doors, um, I, I've got it on notice of people that were there. They said in a, a few days later, those doors were taken down and they were thrown into the basement of the Dakota. And a few weeks later after that, the glass and the handles disappeared. Mm. So evidence ignored, Just... evidence thrown away, evidence destroyed. According to when when I looked into this a few years ago, and mm. I'm just taking from the internet reports that I, I've I've managed to find from newspaper mm. reports that are online and other sources, uh, mm. some of the witnesses that were there that you get a different version of how many shots were fired or how many shots they think were fired. Yeah. Some some claim they heard five or six shots. One woman who was there at the time who didn't see the actual crime take place, but heard no, another woman. five or yeah. six shots. Yeah, you know her. Yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, James Taylor, the musician who lived right next to the Dakota, claims he heard five shots on the night. Um, then there's this Sean Strube, who was who, <laughs> who claims to have been there. And I know I've, I've heard your podcasts and you throw a lot of doubt on Sean Strube. He claims he yeah. was walking down a nearby street. He claims he heard four shots ring out. Although he's reported to have said that some people, and I'm quoting him here, some people told of hearing six shots. So, yeah, I don't know what you make of that. Does that imply well, that people with yeah, bad I mean, memories or? I think so. I mean, we know, we know for sure. I mean, I've seen the gun in evidence. It, it is a five bullet revolver, 0.38 charter arms. Yes. Uh, they, they call it a Saturday night special. It, 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 and, and to be fair, the, the, the serial number on the gun matches the receipt that was found on Mark Chapman. How how nice of him and how considerate a Mark to keep the receipt of his gun on him when he got arrested. So well, they you can claim it back, back on his the... tax returns. Yeah, 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 it must have been, it must have been the reason why he did it. So yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they basically uh, <laughs> traced it back to this JNS Enterprises in Hawaii, very dubious man who sold him the gun. Um, who needs, I think, looking into, uh, he disappeared about a week after the sale, never seen again, but he's from what I've, the brief research I've looked into him, he's a man of interest to me. Um, but anyway, he, he he said, yeah, the guy I sold it to looked like a guy who allegedly was on the news who killed John Lennon. Uh, so, so yeah, the gun, I think the gun matches. Um, so we know it was a, basically the reason I'm telling you all this, so we know we know it was a five bullet revolver. Um, but, and, I, and I think the person who killed John Lennon would not have used, I think they would have used a silencer or a modified gun and modified bullets to not obviously have too many, uh, noises going off because rem remember when they did it as well, Matt. It was done on it was done ten fifty on a Monday night. Um, Monday night football was on, so the streets were fairly empty. Big thing Monday night football in America at the time. Ten fifty, the bars hadn't quite been all chucked out at that point. Uh, you know, I, I think the timing was interesting. I don't think there were that many people around. I, I think what's interesting is Joe Manny in the basement said he heard two or three shots, but then again, he was in a basement. Um, mm. You know, and it was a long way up. Um, so you've got him saying that. You've got Hastings saying four or five. You've got Strube saying four. Other people saying five or six. I just think, you know, when when you hear something like that, you're just you're not going to be thinking straight. You're just you're going to be panicking. You're going to be scared. And I just don't think people, you know, w would be able to recall that exactly across yeah. the board. I think some will get it wrong just because of memory and, and, and shock and whatever. Uh, I'm pretty certain Chapman shot five five bullets. Do you I'm think that certain, Chapman certain shot blanks. actually killed shot and killed John Lennon? Because I think I heard you say in one or two podcasts no. that you think no. he was firing blanks and imagined that he was shooting real yes. bullets and killed yes. John Lennon, yeah. That yes, he was mind controlled into thinking that, yeah. For sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I, I'm 99% certain Mark Chapman did kill John Lennon. I, I think he thinks he did at the time. And I think he has been made to believe that ever since. Um, and the reasons why he was made to believe it have changed. And this is a topic for another com another day, another top uh, uh, podcast. Um, it's, it's very interesting when someone like Mark Chapman, who I believe was a Manchurian Patsy, by the way, I don't think he was a Manchurian assassin. I think he was there just to be sitting there confused, standing there confused, not quite sure what he'd done. Because, um, you know, remember the whole gun scenario on the night of the murder, there's there's a there's an article you can find on my Substack called Mark Chapman Unplugged, 
And, and he says, I, I, I don't really know what the hell I've done. I have nothing against John Lennon. I have nothing against the Beatles or his music. Uh, I, I don't quite remember what happened. I just remember after sort of gunfire, the gun was at my feet and I had a book in my hand. And it was like, that doesn't sound like you're even firing a gun at all, Mark, to be fair. Uh, but then in 92 on Barbara Waters, after 12 years of Milton Klein, Bernard Diamond and all the rest and Secret Service visits and lots of other nefarious visits, which I'll itemise in my book, you know, he, his mind has been completely altered. And now he says, oh, yeah, I sort of fired. Doesn't say what happened to John and what John was doing, why he was firing at him. But he now remembers that Jose Padermo shook the gun out of his right hand, crying um, uh, the doorman, Jose Padermo. And once he shook it out of Mark's hand, Mark thinks he kicked it to the back of the driveway. Did he think it or did he do it? Surely you, you saw it all happening in front of you, Mark. You'd know. And, you, and by the time Joe Manny got up to the driveway, Jose is pacing around the gun, right, at the back of the driveway. So the gun wasn't on Mark Chapman when Joe Manny got there, and the gun wasn't on Mark Chapman when the police arrived. The gun was taken away by Joe Manny and put in a drawer downstairs. But you've got to ask yourself a key question here with Padermo. Why didn't he pick the gun up himself? Why is he walking around it? Chapman at this point is reading a book by the sidewalk, completely passive. Um, Padermo has kicked the gun 25, 30 feet away from him, a gun that he probably thinks has probably been shot out. Why the hell didn't he pick it up and put it in his pocket or take it indoors? And, and I why think did a, I was going to say that there was a police officer at the time, I think, again, again, I think it might have been in Bresler's book, who said, look, he, why did Chapman just stand there reading The Catcher in the Rye? He could have just run off. He could well, have... that was O'Connor. Yeah, that was O'Connor. Basically, O'Connor said, look, you know, the Central Park was just across the road. He could have just run off. We probably never would have found him. He would have got away with it. You know, no, he didn't. Because it was... He didn't because I think the program went wrong. I think Chapman was meant to run. Uh, we, we have statements from Chapman that Padermo said to him, you know, get out of here, just get out of here. But I've also got statements from other people who came slightly later on the scene, which I'll reveal in my book, who also specify that Padermo was desperate and saying more things like the police will be here soon, Mark, get out of here. Now, that to me sounds like an accomplice warning someone that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing here, Mark run i don't think mark chapman was meant to stand there reading the book i think he had a malfunction and i think there was probably a second team of either rook of um road cops or someone else a vigilante who would be seen as someone who was protecting someone from this mad killer running in the park with a gun and i think mark chapman was going to be taken out when he ran i think they, they were hoping he was going to run and i think they were hoping to take him out and, and kill him when he ran i just don't think they foresaw that he'd stand there and get arrested. And um, it was a massive problem for Mark because for them, because once he did get arrested, they had to manage it really quickly. And the people that were corralled very quickly to manage it and get into his cell and contact Mark, I think revealed themselves quite interestingly. Because um, okay. yeah. it was like a panic. There was like a, I think there was a panic. It was like, Oh my God, he's still alive. What does he remember? What What is he going to say? And uh, that's probably a conversation for another day. Yeah, let's get Klein and Diamond uh, and Etal into that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah into, into the it. room with him. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Let, let's 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 assess. Yeah, you know, what, what he remembers and uh, and why he thinks he did it. And, and and that and that changed over time. They had to change it because Catching the Rye, they were quite happy to to go with Catching the Rye. That's fine. Yeah, Mark. Oh, yeah, you did it to promote the book. Great. And and we've got evidence that Klein and Diamond and those guys played along with all that. But that all very quickly changed overnight when that book was found in, in, in John Hinckley's hotel room. Yeah. Because then it was then it was connected to two assassinations and Caption and I had to be taken off the menu. And it was very swiftly. And they went into another tactic uh, oh, to implant yeah. into Mark's mind about what, you know, what reason he did for for what he allegedly did. And oh my goodness, if you start getting John Hinckley and the uh, the attempted <laughs> assassination of Reagan, Ronald Reagan in 1981, if you attach that to the killing of Lenin, there are connections. And oh my goodness, we well, could go well, off just into quickly, huge... just before, just before, just two more minutes, please, um, Mac. Yeah. You, you brought up something really important. And again, I, I want to use this time to, to, to bust some myths. The, wor the world vision uh, connection to Mark is, is a red herring. Um, it, they're, they're basically, the way this red herring came about 
is there's some people said there was a connection with World Vision and the refugee camps, and they're, and they're right, there was and there is, and that's to do but, with John Hinckley being related to the fact his family are, are are related to World Vision, aren't they? Um, yeah, John, yeah, John John Hinckley Jr., the guy who allegedly, or well, I think he did, try and assassinate um, Ronald Reagan, possibly not shooting. Possibly there were other shooters there. That, that's something I've not researched, so I can't yeah. comment. But basically, his dad was a, a a senior member, possibly a founder of World Vision, which is a Christian organization. And when people realized that World Vision had a connection to a Vietnamese refugee camp called Fort, uh, Fort Chaffee that Mark Chapman worked at, they put two and two together and go, Mark Chapman, John Hinckley, C- CIA. Uh, George, George Bush, CIA. It, it's just not true. And it need, it, it's one of these red herrings, a bit like Padermo, it, it needs to be put to bed because the truth of it is, Chapman was Fort Chaffee was a government run Vietnamese refugee camp. It was 39,000 people there. It was, a, it was a big money spinner for the American uh, defense industry. It, they made it, I think they made something, I think it cost about $340 million in the mid 70s to run that camp for as long as it, as long as it was run. So it was someone was making an awful lot of money out of running that camp. And I think US defense uh, billed about $250 million to run that refugee camp. So you know, refugees, big business refugees for some people, but I'm getting I'm getting off topic here. Basically, Mark Chapman was put, there was lots of different groups were put in there as volunteers, and most of them were Christian groups. The Christian group that Mark Chapman was put into there to, uh, to do a job for was, was when he was working for the YMCA, and he was put in there as a kind of recreational uh, guy. To, a to camp sort of counsellor, wasn't it, for kids? Camp counsellor yeah. to, to play with the kids and to be, to be a sympathetic ear to the kids, right? So that, that was why Chapman was in there. World Vision's connection to Fort Chaffee was they were part of many groups, not just World Vision, uh, that, that were there to resettle uh, the refugees into good old Christian homes. Uh, and that's, that's what World Vision were. That's, that was their role. There, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of research done into those refugee camps. People have even written books about them. You can get to the bottom of exactly what went on there and how much it cost and who did what. And I think what's happened is years ago, a researcher's kind of, seen that World Vision had this role about placing orphans from the camp into American homes and they've gone, who's World Vision? Oh, John Hinckley, George Bush, uh, oh, uh, you know, catching their eye, assassination. It must all be linked. It's not. And uh, there's enough nefarious stuff about Mark Chapman and brainwashing and the fact that he was a Manchurian patsy. We don't need World Vision. there's, There's plenty of other evidence without throwing Hinckley and Bush in there. And and Jose Padermo, as you mentioned in passing, there you, you're not convinced that he because he's especially, not, he's yeah, not, especially within he's the alternative not. arena, when yeah. people discuss John Lennon's killing, they'll, they'll the Every name time. of Jose Padermo is always the name that gets thrown up as the real assassin. But you don't believe that he had anything to do with actually shooting oh, John oh, Lennon? No, 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 no. I don't think he shot John Lennon. I'm pretty yeah. sure about that. I mean, he might. He was there, but it's yeah. highly unlikely he shot John Lennon. He's just not Bayer Pigs Padermo. And it's, oh it's, right, it's a, I see. Yeah, I've it's, I've it's had my shame. doubts about this as oh, well. He's yeah. not. I, I can verify. He was born. Uh, he, he started working at the Dakota in 1969. Um, Dakota Jose. He was born 20, 30 years later after San Genis Padermo was born. Uh, we know when he died. We know we know who his sons are. We know where he lived. We know we know everything about him. We know when he came to the US. We know what he did. Um, and the thing is, you, you've got to, the one thing I'm absolutely certain of is he started working there in 1969, right? Mm. Now, John Lennon didn't actually come to America till 1971, and he didn't start living in the Dakota till 1973. So how could Jose Sanginis, Bay of Pigs, CIA operative, you know, top assassin, know that in four years' time when he starts working at the Dakota as a doorman that John Lennon's going to turn up, and then seven years later he's going to be in place to to take him out. It's, it's, it's just, I can understand why people got excited about it. And I think it was a red herring that was deliberately put out there. Um, uh, I don't think Jim Gaines deliberately did it, but I think the people who saw that Jim Gaines put this stuff out there ran with it and, and started to do a disinformation campaign. Because what happened was just very quickly, no one knew who he was for seven years. The Dakota doorman was kind of kept a secret. Uh, his name was never put out there. He was just always called the doorman. Jose never worked the door again. That's a really important point. He went and worked in the basement the day after the murder and was never seen again. I think Dakota Jose Padova is a really interesting guy. I think he is possibly involved nefariously, but he's not the guy they said he was. So basically when Jim Gaines said in 1987 that he was a, a, an ex-Cuban, anti-Castro guy who spoke to Mark about the JFK assassination in the Bay of Pigs, 
everybody just went off and thought, right, we've got some info on this guy now. Let's just put into a search engine or, or whatever they used at the time, Jose Paderma Bear Pigs. And there was a really serious dude. In fact, there was a few serious dudes who, you know, fought at the Bear Pigs who were called Padermo. Uh, and one of them was called Jose Sanginas Padermo, who was in charge of a group of assassins called Operation 40, who had links to Richard Nixon. So when you put all these things together, it's, it's just too delicious. It's too exciting. It's like, wow, there's Nixon, there's Bear Pigs, there's like Assassin. He was there and there's a CIA connection. It's like, wonderful. But the problem is it's not true. And, and I think that people, there's enough problems with Dakota Jose. You know, he did so many strange things on the night. And, hmm. and if there was a trigger person for Mark Chapman, it was almost certainly him. So he's a man of great interest to me. Um, and I think he probably on balance was nefariously involved, in my opinion. Um, but he's not that guy. And, and a bit like the World Vision thing, it, it's like I, I think it's been allowed and promoted to be put out there as disinformation. Because if you're focusing on, on Op 40 and Bay of Pigs and that massive rabbit hole, you're not actually focusing on what really happened in the driveway and who Mark Chapman was and who Dakota Jose Padermo was. Because what's interesting about Dakota Jose Padermo, he was given the job by an older brother. Who's he? Who's that Padermo? That's the Padermo I'd really like to find out about. And Padermo was a very common name. There's there's many, many Jose Padermos in Cuba at the time yeah. and, and still to this day. It's a bit, you know, really common name in Cuba. And, and plus, if you were a, an assassin running a group of assassins, because Jose Sanjuanes Padoma was a very serious individual. Would you, would you go and work the door at the Dakota opening car doors for people, you know, when your career is kind of winding down? Would he really do that? I don't think so. And if you did go and do that, would you use your real name? You know, I spoke to Larry Hancock about this and he's a real expert on these, you know, far right Cubans who came over and worked for the CIA. And he said they, they changed their name like, you know, people have breakfast every morning. It's like they yeah. change their names all the time. It's like he wouldn't have kept his real name. Yeah. So I think that's that's one myth that really needs to be put to bed. So, so yeah. goes for World Vision, uh, because there's enough anomalies out there. There's enough questions to, to sort of clarify without getting you know caught up in that. So you've got a Substack page, and I would really recommend people go take a look at that because you thanks, thanks, constantly Matt. update it. It's like a blog page, and there's so much information that you're posting on on that on that page. Um, I I assume that these are going to be featured in the book, or are, are these yes. additional? Yeah, they they, are yeah, they, because... they will be. Some some aren't. Some a couple aren't featured in the book. Yeah, they, some of it's exclusive to the to Substack. Most of it is in the book, in, in obviously in a slightly different form. But yeah, there's a lot of info there about Jose and about Bullets and about Chapman. And yeah, thank you for those kind words. Yeah, if you go to davidwhelan.substack.com, uh, yeah, it's it's all there for you. You can you can pick out a lot of stuff there. And there's there's a YouTube channel. There's an awful lot of videos and, and clips now that you can see on Assassination of Lenin on my YouTube channel, which will uh, will enlighten you. Because what's interesting is Matt, I think what, what what the people who put all this together didn't quite figure out is they they thought they got away with it. And I think for 43 years, they've all sat there smoking their cigars going, every single book and every single documentary is is going our way. And it's all official narrative. It's all a bit cloudy. And it's all a bit kind of, you know, difficult to put together. And I think they've got lazy. And I think over the years in certain documentaries, certain people talk too much and give stuff away, thinking that they're safe and secure. And the official narrative will always be holding sway. So I think people will find a lot of interesting stuff on the youtube channel and 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 one last thing i want to say matt is you know once this book's out guys i, I suspect i'll get pulled in to do another but i, I kind of want to just leave I, I, I want to kind of draw a line under it and say okay guys i've done my bit over to you you know just run with it and and what i hope doesn't happen in our community calling it our community but if, if, if a j if a john lennon assassination research community does grow and i think it will uh, a bit like the JFK community. And that's often a good thing. I just hope it doesn't become a little bit like the JFK assassination research community where you get all this kind of infighting and people go, oh, well, I just, I believe Padermo was Bay of Pigs and I'm sticking to that. And that Whelan guy's talking rubbish. He's a shill. And, uh, and, and what's happened in the JFK community is people go off and they silo off into their own little, you know, That's happened groups. with the 9-11 
community yeah, it's as well. Just, the, yeah, it's kind of I, I, we can all disagree. Is is the point I'm trying to make? You know, I, these are all just my opinions. If, if you want to say, you know, Dakota Jose was bad pigs, fine, great. I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say you're wrong. I'm, I'm just saying that's not what I, what I believe, and I just think we all need to help each other. There's a lot more still to be unearthed. Um, you know, Bres- as you say, May Brussels started it, then, you know, um, Bresler, and then Phil Strongman wrote a book. Though yeah. he Sadly, yeah. he, he came out before Halloran in 2011, so he couldn't really, you know, understand the medical stuff properly, and, and I think he got Padermo wrong. But, you know, he put a book out there. It's not easy, so fair play to him for doing that. And, you know, the stuff that you've been doing. And, and I just think, you know, I, I just hope a whole army of more Lennon researchers comes on board once my book's out, you know, and, and please, you know, please let's all work together and, you know, just be open-minded to each other's different theories and, uh, and keep digging because, you know, 60 years later, there's still JFK stuff coming out. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's, that was something that people didn't believe from day one. I think with Lennon, people are only now beginning to sort of go, that's a bit weird. That's not right. That's wrong. So we've got a long way to go before we get to that kind of volume of research. But I really hope it does go that way because there is an yeah. awful lot more to uncover. And, uh, you know, I'm well done for all the stuff you've been doing. And thanks for this opportunity to uh, to allow me to come on and, and talk about my work. Um, I just wanted to say that your Substack page with regards to Podomo, you've actually got a photograph of him on there, which is quite yeah. a first, isn't it? Yeah, a, a guy from Chile, lovely guy, uh, approached me. Uh, again, it was nothing to do with me, this one. Uh, he's a fan of what I was doing, which is great. And then he just said, look, I've, I've found a picture. Wow. Uh, and there it is. Yeah, it's great. It's just great to see the guy's face at last because there's been so many wrong. I and mean, I, I bought into the wrong pictures. I, I initially thought the guy with the tash and the old guy on Wiki Spooks was him. Yeah, there's so many wrong pictures of Padermo. That, oh, this is Jose. And, and, but that, that one's, I've had that one that's now on my Substack verified by people who work in Dakota. So that's definitely him. So yeah. we finally now got we finally got a face at last. Okay, to round this off, thank you very much for coming. But I just wanted to ask you, who do you think was behind it and why? At this point, <laughs> I mean that could change by the day, by the minute, even maybe. But yeah, bit of an impossible question to answer, I know. But do uh, yeah, well, I, I, can't, I kind of think I do know, and my, I think my book will will point towards those people and those organisations. I, I won't reveal it now. I'll let people read the book. I've also got to be very careful, you know, that I don't get uh, into libel issues uh, mm-hmm. because some of the people that I think are behind it are still alive. Um, so uh, what, what my book will do is it will lay out all the people that are involved in a way that I don't think they should be involved. Uh, and I think I make it quite explicit without making it explicit, if you know what I mean, in my book, uh, yeah. who I think uh, might be involved or I'm fairly sure is involved. Uh, what I will say at this stage, Matt, is this kind of operation from what, what I've uncovered, and I think most operations like this are the same, it's it's a silo. It's it's lots of different groups coming together to do different jobs uh, with different purposes. I, I don't think it's a kind of Dr. No villain sitting in a bunker calling a hit, you know, for Spectre. Or I don't think it's Ronald Reagan sitting in the, in the Oval Office calling a hit. You know, one big super guy sort of putting the order down. I think this one is a lot of different groups who came together with similar interests, who all kind of sat in a room and went, Do you know what? If that Lenin socialist devil worshipping, you know, uh, anti war, bad for business scumbag died things would be great, wouldn't they? We, you know, we'd get one back on the scumbag and we'd kind of make things nice and clear for Ronnie to do all the despicable things that his administration did in um, in Central America. And so Lennon was I, coming out of his retirement, his was, his, his retreat was. from the music business, and he was planning on on um, was. holding demonstrations again, street demonstrations. So, exactly. And I, and I just think this, different groups who are connected, and I hope I will, my book will clearly show those connections, came together and I think there was a group that looked after Mark Chapman and made sure he was standing there as a, a Manchurian candidate Patsy. I think there was a group that did the hit and I think the hit was done inside the vestibule on the stairway in, in an area that Mark Chapman could not even see, never alone shoot John in. Um, I've got a lot of evidence that points that way now. 
Uh, and I think there was a group that controlled the investigation and the NYPD, which was, if you look up NYPD corruption, 1970s, 1980s, probably one of the most corrupt police forces in history. Um, so I don't think that would have been very difficult to get an investigation quashed or over overlooked in many areas. And I think there was a media organisation uh, that made sure that disinformation was seeped out over many years in many documentaries and books and articles to keep people confused. And I think those four things all came together. And I think the people that put it all together probably thought they got away with it. And I'm glad to say now that I think they're going to have to all ask some very awkward questions very soon. David, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. All the best, mate. So there you go. That's me in conversation with David Whelan, uh, talking to him earlier in November 2023, ahead of the release of his new book on the assassination of John Lennon. Um, As I mentioned earlier uh, in my conversation with David, if you're interested to check out more of his work, there's that YouTube channel of his that we mentioned. There's also his uh, Substack page, which you can find uh, by typing in davidwhelan.substack.com dot com that's david whelan dot substack dot com and while i'm at it why not plug some of my stuff as well um there's my site the occult beetles that's the occult beetles dot wordpress dot com uh, i also have the site um uh, conspira media which takes a look at the uh, machinations whether alleged or not uh, behind the uh, 60s counterculture movement of uh, london and whether or not it was social engineered uh, there's a number of uh, articles uh, you can find that site by typing in conspiromedia.wordpress.com and there's my facebook page where you get an amalgamation of all of it the Beatles stuff the 60s counterculture stuff the social engineering stuff the lot and then some and you can find my Conspira Media Facebook page by typing in facebook.com forward slash Conspiro Media forward slash thanks a lot for listening until the next time